Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Seriously Wrong podcast, only for the highly evolved. Luckily, all humans are equally evolved, and there is no true distinction between high and low in evolution. Yeah, everything is equally evolved because everything has been sufficient to get this far. Although you could argue that humans have some unique features in terms of complexity of social organization and so on. Right. Uh, Even if there was like life on another planet that had only been evolving for half as long, there's no guarantee that we would be, we would have more complex features than them. And dogs have a better sense of smell than us. Damn. (laughs) Inferior to dogs. (laughs) Yeah, no, this is an episode about evolutionary psychology. It's a part of a series that we're doing on evolutionary psychology. Yeah, and this time we're going to be listening to and engaging with some clips of evolutionary psychologists in their own words, promoting their books, to interrogate the politics of evolutionary psychologists and evolutionary psychology. Because, as we said in the last episode, Evolutionary psychology isn't an impartial branch of science looking to understand things about human history. I wish it was, but it's not. It is a political movement to naturalize hierarchical difference, in particular between men and women. It is part of a thousand-year-plus trajectory of naturalizing women as biologically inferior to men, using now the language of science and evolution to do that. Uh, It is part and parcel with sociobiology, eugenic race science, and a variety of other pseudoscientific applications of scientific ideas and principles to promote socially reactionary views uh, that perpetuate domination and submission of people amongst the human population. That's what is going on here with evolutionary psychology. It is abundantly obvious when you listen to them talk and you read their work. Yeah, last time we made that claim based on the types of claims that are typical of evolutionary psychology and the types of evidence and logic uh, that they use to make those claims. But we thought listening to some of these Evo psych people talk about their own ideas, often, you know, in a podcast situation, they're a little less guarded or they get asked a more political question that's less technically based on their specific research and so we just thought it would be really good to like hear them in their own words to get sort of a better idea of like is that what this field of thought is functionally doing and to some extent at least is that what the people who are perpetuating this field of thought is that how they see the implications of their work We say like, hey, you are naturalizing patriarchal relationships between men and women where men are superior and women are inferior. There is not a deep biological difference between men and women that casts women to a permanent role of subordination under men. This is actually a political context that you're obscuring with this pseudoscience. And then they say, oh, so you're another blank slatist. You think that people can just be anything in the world. Evolution has nothing to do with the way our society organizes, including the way that it organizes with older men being in charge of younger men, women, and children. That's as natural as an apple falling from a tree. That's as natural as a sunset. And you believe, you must believe, if you disagree with me, that human beings are just born blank slates. That's what we're standing up against is this foolish kind of liberal idea that humans are just infinitely moldable. Yeah, it's a, it's a straw man, Mott and Bailey type thing where you can like make a whole bunch of specific claims about the psychology of men and the psychology of women and how they naturally lead to the social structures that we've observed in a lot of human societies. There's been a lot of patriarchal society, so they say that has a basis in evolution. Denying that, saying, oh, maybe there was contingent 
historical factors that led to sociologically men dominating women, but it's not like an ingrained psychological fact. And like, there's actually a lot of reason to think this because there's a lot of flexibility in the psychology of men and women, even these observed differences that they're pointing to in survey data and modern survey data tend to be really, really small. Uh, so like you're saying, this really, really small effect couldn't come from culture and it couldn't been a cultural thing that's unfolded over a few thousand years and propagated around the world for various reasons. No, it has to be biological. Uh, and they're like, no, but the only alternative to that is that you're saying not only is this cultural, not only is like patriarchy and the differences between men and women cultural, you're saying everything is completely cultural. It's complete blank slate. It's, you know, there's nothing inborn in evolution in our psychology at all. And humans could do any, they, they could find fruit disgusting and human feces delicious psychologically. Uh, no, obviously, that's not the only alternative to the idea that patriarchy is psychologically naturalized. There could be elements of our psychology that are evolutionary, biologically rooted, but it just doesn't include these slight differences between men and women that we find on survey data. And those ones are cultural, not all of them. Yeah. And human beings were obviously the product of a long path of evolution that went through a variety of different directions at different times in ways that are almost entirely unknowable to us because there are no records. You know, huge areas of history where the most evidence we have is small fractured parts of proto-human skulls. Uh, we don't know what was going on in history. That is, that's just uh, a fact about history and human evolution. So we do know generally, you know, we evolved in general to have opposable thumbs and we evolved in general to stand upright. We evolved prefrontal cortexes that give us a great deal of cognitive flexibility in order to sort of interrupt our impulses and think about what we want to do and make decisions based on that, both cultural and personal decisions. And from all the things that we evolved in our complex social relationships, our ability to have lasting institutions and shared bodies of knowledge that help us facilitate group actions, humans evolved to have maximum political and social freedom, organizational, institutional, and technological freedom. That seems to be the thing that is really defines us in relation to other animals that we're aware of. And in that freedom, that includes the freedom to organize our society in a variety of ways. And at some point in history, as a political decision, older men in particular, older straight men in particular, created institutions of domination, institutions that bifurcated society along the lines of sex and gender to organize in ways that disenfranchised women for the advantage of men. That is a, an alternate theory to the idea that humans like evolved patriarchy, which is a very common idea within evolutionary psychology circles. Today's episode of the Seriously Wrong podcast is brought to you by an exciting new book by Dr. Evo Psych, the real science of mating that can help you live your life. Hi, I'm Dr. Evo Syke, and we've had a number of exciting developments in my home field of evolutionary psychology. A recent study surveyed college co-eds about screen time and found they were spending an astounding amount of time on the phone, which confirmed our theory that in the evolutionary environment of adaptation, there were giant, floating, glowing screens in nature, which have since gone extinct, that the primordial humans just could not help staring at. This evolutionary origin of our current screen time behavior is the first step to creating a theory of how to best utilize this evolutionary adaptation in history. I also devote a chapter to my new theory, Giant Cane Coming From Off Stage Theory, the one that finds that humorous men evolved through a process where everyone in the community would hold a giant hooked cane together and as he was performing his stand-up routine in the evolutionary environment of adaptation if he wasn't making people laugh the giant cane would come and whoop, and pull him off and then uh, he would have less access to sexual and reproductive opportunities as a result and we have a lot of evidence to support this contemporary polling data and finally, long have evolutionary psychologists puzzled over the question why cheerleaders dance instead of play football. We now do have an answer for the first time. And we can't give away everything in the ad, so you're going to have to read the whole book. 
But the short version is that ritualized dancing of women and the fighting of warrior men were two complementary parts of a type of ancient warfare, uh, which we theorize exists. And contemporary survey of co-eds shows is absolutely proven. So please do check out my book. Check out my previous books, How to Trick Women and Capture Them. Trapped, colon, why humans have a biological imperative to reinforce social institutions of patriarchy and have no choice. And of course, my original book and my doctoral thesis, The Evolutionary Origins of Leaving the Toilet Seat Up, which was praised for its in-depth contemporary polling on women getting trapped and the evolutionary benefits of trapping women in your toilet. The real science of mating that can help you live your life. The exciting new book from best-selling author, Dr. Evo Psych. Pre-order your copy today. And now back to our show. So for our first clip here, we have Andrew Huberman, who's a podcaster, uh, scientist, uh, uh, interviewing David Buss who's a prominent evolutionary psychologist. Andrew Huberman, he's got one of the biggest podcasts now. It's like a science and lifestyle podcast. Right. I've listened to a few episodes because you recommended it to me, but I listened I've to him over, seen the, it around. over the pandemic. Yeah. And, and, but I remember listening to the Evo Psych episode when it came out and being like, oh my God, like this just really ruins <laughs> the Huberman show for me. Like, right. Well, here, let, yeah, let's, we got a clip of this. We'll see. How does, he, how does he introduce his guest in the field of evolutionary psychology? And so throughout today's discussion, you'll notice that I'm wrapped with attention, trying to extract as much information as I can from Dr. Buss about the real science of human mate selection and mating strategy. I'm certain that everyone will take away extremely valuable knowledge that they can use in existing or future relationships from this discussion with Dr. Buss. The Dr. Buss, the like real, like there's so much deference being paid here. The real science the real of human science. mating. Yeah. Oh, my God. And it made me think, you know, I was like, should I not listen to his right. <laughs> advice on other things? Like, if this is how deferential... Okay, I mean, I think maybe it would be helpful also to... So, mostly their conversation was... It kind of veered between being, like, uncomfortably, like, bro and almost locker roomy for moments of, like, the jokes and vibe when they were talking about some of the, the stuff. Uh, but... He was mostly on good behavior. David Buss was on good behavior, not making weird political statements, downplaying the the is ought thing, you know, emphasizing the natural is not the good, etc. On good behavior, but it kind of slipped up. This is the moment where scientist influencer, <laughs> scientist influencer Andrew Huberman and Evo Psych influencer let the mask slip. I should have asked this earlier, but what is the impact on? mate value perceived or real of a woman having already had children. You know, uh, for instance, friends of mine who are married and divorced, who have children will often post pictures of themselves with their children in their online profiles because it shows a, a strong sense of paternal instinct. Um, in women, the, the, the opposite is also true. Women with children show capacity. It, it demonstrates fertility, at least at, at one point. Does it positively, negatively, or neutrally impact a woman to already have children when seeking a another mate. But yeah. Like. As a general rule, it decreases her mate value because kids with another mate are viewed as a cost, not, not a benefit. And they're a cost on multiple uh, dimensions, one of which they're going to be a cost to the guy uh, because he's going to have to invest resources, time, attention, and so forth. But also a portion of her effort and resources are going to be devoted toward kids who are not genetically related to him. In, so in general, it's a cost, not a benefit. It will decrease a woman's and a man's mate value to have kids, especially kids who are financially, who are young and financially dependent. But what happens is, let's say the woman would be an eight without kids. A guy who's a six might be able to attract her and might feel lucky to attract her because there's no way he would have been able to attract her under other conditions. But that's why the display of effort investing in her kids is often a mating tactic. And so they, in essence, become equivalent in mate value as a result of that. But will she be able to attract, on average, other eights? Um, less likely. 
One of the first things I caught on just at the very beginning is children are viewed as a cost. That is a very, very interesting statement because on one level, the Evo Psych people are saying that this is just one lens through which to view things. And like, there's like a level on which there's these gene things going on. But to say publicly on a public podcast that children are viewed as a cost evolutionarily biologically sounds like a statement about what's in the heads of all men like it sounds like that's how men view children of women that they might be going with as a cost but like i don't think there's any evidence that that view is the primary characterization of how people view children. I don't know if there's evidence that that's what it is. Like, if you think about things in terms of evolution and like investing time in your offspring versus offspring that isn't biologically related to you, which one is better for your genes? Viewed from that perspective, you can make the argument that these kids are a cost. Or if you think about it in terms of like literal cost in a modern capitalist society that like it wouldn't even necessarily be a financial cost depending on the finances of your partner like just because you're dating someone doesn't mean that you're you have to support their kids necessarily i think like generally if you're in love with someone and they have children and you spend time around those children you're going to form relationships with those children and grow to love them and want to take care of them like human adults want to generally take care of children Kids are cute. You want to help them. I think the children of potential mate are generally viewed as lovable children. Bus is doing this thing that you see a lot in evolutionary psychology where you take a contemporary sentiment, like, for example, oh, my friend says that he doesn't want to date anyone who's a single mom. And then you project that sort of contemporary context onto an ancient evolutionary context and assume based on literally nothing that people's individual views in the present represent some sort of evolved thing based on an uh, evolutionary environment of adaptation, but sort of like chiseling it in stone as an ancient rule of human relations when it's actually a contemporary sort of arbitrary thing. But did the environment of evolutionary adaptation really actually have nuclear families where fathers are responsible to feed the half-siblings of his children? So much so that it was an evolutionary pressure on the development of the human brain? And when in our sort of seven million year history since bipedal apes did we develop this idea that there is such a thing as a cost genetically and children are one of them? When do we evolve the sense of children as being financial dependents? When do we get the gene for recognizing the financial dependence of a child? It's, and also the, the, uh, my favorite yeah, the most you... scientific human categorization system is eights and sixes. And <laughs> uh, it's like a scene from American Pie or something. Like you know, it, it always reminds me of the Howard Stern show. That was one of the first comedy radio show When he first went to satellite radio and you could get it anywhere in the world, I was in like high school. And we listened to Howard Stern, my friends and I, and there's always talk about these numbers, sixes, sevens, right? Anyway, it's just, it just, yeah, like this bro like rating women thing. It's very like revealing of a particular cultural place this is coming from. So what might be the evidence to suggest that during the Stone Age, the perceptions of the fertility of women and their attractiveness were not the way that Huberman theorized in saying maybe it makes people look fertile if they have children or they look like a provider, et cetera. And I even have an anecdote. And anecdotes are the most important form of story in Evo Psych. So this is like him playing the the <laughs> this is like the trump card of Evo Psych. It's like, hey, one time I met a guy who blah 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 blah. <laughs> It's actually a real criticism I have of Buss across the interviews. He flows in and out of anecdotes and science and treats them as basically uh, interchangeable information. But yeah, Huberman has an interesting hypothesis. He says people might be attracted to people who have demonstrated. For, this all makes perfect sense within the Evo Psych framework as a theory. Right. Buss says, no, that's not the case. In general, it's seen as a cost. And what's he basing that on? It's a cost under the current society we live in where people are aware of the financial costs of cognitively in our evolved brains are 
the yeah. handle complex symbols. We live in a context where children incur costs, and that might be the way that people would talk about their aversion to dating someone with kids in the current day. He turns that anecdote about the president, or it might even be some survey data or something about the way people perceive this thing in the, in the modern day, and then he constructs a hypothetical Stone Age context which disproves enough enough that as an expert in the field, he can just say, nah, when, <laughs> when Huberman brings yeah, up like his little theory. A, it, it is a cost. Yeah, it, it, yeah, just, it, it is, is generally seen as a cost. Yeah, the, the thing about it being the current day thing is so relevant because nuclear families where like one man is supposed to provide for all the like the woman and all the kids under his roof. Uh, where this would be a cost to you individually is like a relatively modern thing. And when I imagine the one single Stone Age culture that humans existed in for tens of thousands of years, kids would generally be taken care of by the whole group as a whole. And having another kid around isn't a cost to you particularly. Like if all the men are going out to hunt and all the women are staying back gathering and then all that food gets shared amongst your group, your tribe, like, how is that a cost to you individually if a person you want to have sex with already has another kid? It, like, makes no sense why that would be thought of as a cost in that time period if my little theory about how this worked at the time is true. I, I don't even know what his little theory about how it worked at the time. It was like, was there just, like, nuclear families, like, roaming the woods and, like... <laughs> If you found a woman with other kids, you're like personally providing meat for them or something like it's goofy. It's it's based on normalizing like a very, very modern idea of the family and providership. And even I said like that, that gender division of labor thing. But there's a recent, uh, I think, New Scientist sort of review of a whole bunch of research on this anthropological research and just like it's just actually not true that men hunted all the time and women stayed back and gathered or made baskets or whatever like doesn't seem to match the data we have a ton of evidence of women hunting so i wanted to make that clear because i kind of said that was my idea of the past but i was also verging into yeah, I interpret it like my simple little idea, like that. Yeah, like, yeah. I was, like, I was kind of in like a mode of like you don't even have to stray from what they would imagine it was like to show why this is ridiculous. This, this is what drives me crazy about EvoPsych. Like human beings have existed for at least two hundred thousand years. Proto humans were making tools two and a half million years ago, three million years ago. There is no single environment of evolutionary adaptation. The features we have are the result of long processes. We've adapted to a variety of different environments in a sequential order. The idea that we evolved to just uniformly always see other people's children as a cost and nothing else uh, just boggles my mind because it's just like, when would that happen? What was the mechanism of it? At what point in our enormous history did that happen? And why didn't it happen sooner or later? Or like, these are the questions that come to mind for me with Evo Psych. It's just spurious, imaginary shit. So I, I think there's a real possibility that historically, actually, that Huberman could be right in a way in certain contexts in certain places where having multiple strong children could be seen as a very attractive feature. A lot of our uh, recent history, there was a high level of child mortality. Yeah. And having kids throughout a lot of history, rather than being seen as a cost, was seen as a benefit because they can do things like you know they hit 13 or even 10 a lot like they can help out they're like useful they're yeah, work they can help yeah we're, and this is we're talking about like a couple over the last couple hundred years we've seen the change from benefits to cost flip in the direction of children being seen right. as costs so that's not enough time frame to talk about like an evolutionary change in either direction but it just makes sense to think that over a 2.9 million year history, the pendulum swing that we've experienced in recent history between children being benefits to children being costs may have happened numerous times, sometimes even in individual lifetimes based on external circumstances. Uh, it's hard to make a prediction or guess that the overall historical interpretation of children could be seen that way in all contexts and all cultures and all like material environments. So I think like the safest estimate is that that probably doesn't have a function on human evolution. That that is something that is below the gradient that is captured by the genetic <laughs> base of humanity. Right. Um, how children are seen at any given time. Because you also you don't need to have the most kids. 
You don't need to have the best kids. You don't need to have kids in any particular way at any particular time. You don't need to have kids young or old or in any amount or anything like that to be propagated forward through generations. So we could guess that reproducing more frequently has a bigger benefit over a long time period, propagating your genes more. But every time you reproduce, you're mixing your genes with someone else's. The more you're reproducing, the more you're diluting. Yeah, I mean, like, in, in theory, like, the best thing for you to do to pass your genes, the most copies of your genes on could be a sort of kin selection-y uncle thing where you just, like, really encourage all your brothers and sisters to have as many kids as possible, but you're not going to have any kids, but then you just help out with all the... Like, if you were, like, consciously strategizing about genes, in theory, that could be one of the best ways to go about it to not bother trying to find a partner yourself just really really like invested in everyone who's kind of related to you having kids and like helping that happen would be a good strategy for passing your gene like just as good as having kids yourself because like you're saying your kids only 50 percent your genes 25 so like you'd be like oh your sister's kids are even less your genes than yours are but like on an evolutionary time period, it's not that big of a difference. It's like one generation's separation from like. Yeah, this actually this d dilution thing. I have to think about it more. But this uh, that for me just broke the whole universe for the genetic selection people. Like, I, I already knew that people weren't thinking about genes. People aren't walking around being like, "Oh, time for some genetic action," you know. Like time, <laughs> like when people have a kid, they're not like, "Time to I want to make sure my genes exist for longer." Like, yeah, we, <laughs> I already knew that, but that just, it just clicked for me. It was like, your genes don't even get passed on. Like most of them are just lost, you know, just most of them are just like, every time you make a photocopy, some of the genes are missing. Yeah. And you're making like a half photocopy, like mixed with a photocopy of someone else. Yeah. It's just, it I, is. It's like. Also, I think some, of, some of my best genes, other people clearly have as well. Like I'm not, I'm not like, oh, we need to make sure math stays alive. Yeah, even but... <laughs> yeah, the kin selection thing, there's, there's an issue to me with that is like, yeah, like how many of my genes that are like my brother's genes or sister's genes compared to like someone's genes who's quote unquote not related to me, but maybe they're like 13th cousin or whatever, like they're kind of like a nearby band of people in evolutionary history who maybe there was some mixing 10 generations ago. Like there's, I don't care there's about just those these genes. genes out there. It's not like... Unless it passes through my family's sperm and my family's <laughs> eggs, I have no interest in protecting that. I don't care if it's exactly literally the same as me in, in every way for <laughs> like, you know, 99 point something or yeah. some high incredible amount. Unless it passes through my dad's sperm, my dad's dad's sperm, my sperm, my kid's sperm, masculine, paternity, gene passing. Yeah, it seems likely to me that a lot of human behaviors have just evolved for not even kin selection, just like human selection. Like what behaviors in the group of humans entirely make the group of humans entirely more likely to live on? I can see evolutionary adaptations for that a lot more than I see like these micro tweaking of like men's behaviors. They, they really love waist to hip ratios that are this number versus this number because there's some statistically tiny evolutionary benefit to preferring a different waist to hip ratio. They might be more likely to carry a baby to term. And then these hyper specific modules in brains of only men and not women or women and not men to have these like sexual competition with people of the same sex as you will. Like you want your sperm and not your cousin's sperm to be in this egg, to pass on your genes to the future generation, not your cousins, not anyone who's close to you, your sperm. Yeah. And the really weird thing about that, apart from the fact that obviously no one thinks that way, and especially you wouldn't think that way if uh, you didn't know about DNA and genetics and stuff. All humans share the majority of their DNA, like we said. So, like, if you're really interested in protecting your genes, rather than this specific strand of your family's particular mutations, particular eccentricities, the ones that you happen to have inherited, which I don't know why anyone would be interested in that in particular. That's not the part of you that, you know, makes us who we are. If you want to protect the majority of your genes, then you should want to help all humans always, protect all humans always, worry about the 
continuation of all humans always. And I think that's probably what happened. We've evolved the sense of empathy, caring for each other and stuff like that. You want to help an old lady cross the street with her groceries and stuff? Like, why is that? Why did the Evo psych guys never talk about helping little old ladies cross the street? That clearly had a major impact on who we are. It comes from a deep place. It's because we're gene calculating. We're gene chessboards. We understand the old lady shares most of our genes with us. We understand that her grandkids share most of their genes with us and that she provides an allo parenting relationship that helps enrich those kids who have most of our genes. Obviously. I think it's also why humans care about biodiversity loss because, you know, not just humans share our genes too. Like if we want genes to be passed forward in the future, you want as many genes as possible. Like Yeah, butterflies, bananas, you name it. It's absolutely. got the same genes as us to a great degree. The loss of a species is the loss of a whole bunch of genes uh, that, you know, we might share. Today's episode of Seriously Wrong is proudly brought to you by Preventing Genetic Dilution Through Waiting As Long As Possible To Reproduce Hi, I'm an evolutionary psychologist, and polling data of coeds has consistently shown that across the board, everyone prefers sleeping with older partners. And the reason for this is simple. Just think about it. If everyone in your lineage is reproducing at the age of 40 instead of your neighbor who's reproducing at the age of 20, that means that you have half as much dilution happening over the same period. And that stacks over time. So the, the genetic benefit of waiting as long as possible, reproducing with the last possible egg at the oldest age possible, is genetically preferred because we have an inborn desire to perpetuate our genes as far as possible into history. Every single time you or someone in your lineage mates, you are diluting your genes by 50%. If you want your genes to exist into the future as much as possible, you want as few of those dilutions to happen as possible. And so it just makes sense that over an evolutionary span of history, the genes that lead to people wanting to reproduce as late as possible would win out in the competition of life and death and an evolutionary time speed. Everyone who is having sex young and having babies young, their genes got diluted away and disappeared over a much quicker span of time. We've heard the criticisms. People say it doesn't matter what the evidence shows. The core premises of evolutionary psychology are unfalsifiable and can be bent over backwards in any context to fit any data to back the core principles that they say, you know, everyone happens to have a preference for old people now, but if all the evidence showed that everyone had a preference for young people, then you could just create a just so story to justify that, to fit your overall narrative. And to that we say, no, that is not true. You cannot justify the exact opposite. That is totally wrong. And it's also not true and impossible for it to be true that it's just cultural that people prefer dating older people because we have a society that venerates older people as being more sexually attractive than younger people. All these cultural things people point to are the result of the biology and not the other way around. And we know that it's true because we theorized that was true and then we did the survey data and the survey data was what we expected, so it has to be biological. Preventing genetic dilution through waiting as long as humanly possible to reproduce. Proud sponsor of today's episode of Seriously Wrong and a principle of human psychology that is genetic and evolved in nature. Now back to our show. We now go to Frontiers of Evolutionary Psychology! All right, next up on Frontiers of Evolutionary Psychology, women be shopping. I'm sorry, I meant to say evolved foraging psychology underlies sex differences in shopping experiences and behaviors. So yeah, when I was growing up, my mom shopped a lot more than my dad. It's, this actually evolved. Did you know that? Uh, <laughs> I would go to my grandma's house after school, and if my mom picked me up, sometimes I'd be like, ugh. Because that meant we might be going to like Walmart, which meant that I was going to go look around. at the game section for 10 minutes and then go find her and get the keys and then wait in the car because I didn't want to stand around for another like 30 minutes or however long she was going to spend looking around the store. Never happened with my dad. So yeah, you're saying this is evolution. Yeah. So 
This study, based on, you guessed it, polling data of co-eds, says women like to shop more than men because shopping is like gathering and foraging, right. which they evolved to do. And men's shopping behavior is more like a hunter. Right. So they just want one thing or whatever. They're like targeted on like the deer, which is like, you know, their video game or they want underwear or they want. So in the survey, they asked a, a number of questions associated with hunting behavior and shopping, which is like, I prefer to shop for a big thing instead of a lot of little things. <laughs> really? And, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so like they're imagining primordial hunters in this question it's like if i go shopping for something big i want to like get a group of people to come shopping with me is one of the questions that they asked okay <laughs> i can't <laughs> because in hunting if you're hunting big game you have like yeah, a yeah crew for of... sure yeah you don't want to go after a bison all by yourself you want backup yeah so not surprisingly maybe thinking about these questions they found very little correlation between hunting behavior <laughs> and men and women Makes a lot um, of sense. I've never once been like, okay, I want to buy a PS5. You know, they they cost a fair amount of money. That's a big purchase. So I get need my all boys my bros together. together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I mean it's it's a wild question. So here, well, I'll, I'll start. I'll, I'll get to that. But they cite in their preamble, they cite a variety of studies talking about different uh, sex differences in cognition, like. For example, men allegedly being better at orienting in general directions like north-south and women navigating by landmarks. Have you ever heard that before? Uh, yeah. I remember yeah. hearing that in like high school or yeah, something. It's, it's vaguely in my um, head somewhere. And in that case, the justification for the hunter-gatherer thing I think is pretty weak, where they say that landmarks are associated with like where a specific food is. Like if you see a rock, that means the pumpkin patch is around the corner. Right. Whereas chasing big game involves more abstract navigation techniques. But spoiler alert, actually, they found absolutely no correlation, not even a weak correlation with these abstract navigation techniques and men and women. They did find that women reported navigating by landmarks more than men, but they didn't find that they navigated by abstract directions less than men. Right. Just, yeah, an interesting detail about the actual data that they got from polling co-eds. Another study they cited in this preamble is that apparently women were better at remembering which specific stall had a specific food at a farmer's market. Okay. So they, it's, this is a women gathering right, study. Right, like a bank shot. They, they yeah. knew which bushes produced the best berries. Because or women, yeah, exactly. Women were gathering for so long in history all the time that the ones that weren't good at remembering which stall had the pumpkin pie would die or whatever. <laughs> right. And that persists to this day. But yeah, we should say also, I think we may have mentioned this, but it was recently highly publicized that the man, the hunter myth was... Yeah, I think that's in this episode, but yeah, they did like some review of a whole bunch of anthropological research, I think. Yeah, and basically it's like... Or archaeological. There is a tendency for men to hunt more than women in general, but in only th like about three out of ten cultures... Do women participate in absolutely no hunting? Right. So in most cultures, women hunt at least some of the time and men gather at least some of the time. Uh, so that, yeah, that gendered division of labor isn't a hard and fast rule of biology at the very least. Oh, yeah, they said something interesting. They cite David Buss. They said, from an evolutionary perspective, women might be more likely to see shopping as a recreational activity because it represents an opportunity to meet potential mates who have more money to spend. So Wait, what? Yeah, so I know you're you're asking the same question I asked, which is if women be shopping and men don't be shopping, then why would women go to shop and socialize in order to meet men who have money? And also, I mean, the same question has been asked before. Maybe the only men who are shopping are the ones, the ones who don't have, have women, yeah, so it's like don't a, have it's wife a good slaves place. to go shop for them. So yeah, they say that women see shopping as socializing because it's easier to socialize when gathering than when hunting when hunting you have to be kind of focused on the the thing and more technical and making plans to like chase down the bison or whatever it is i wonder if even that's true because i'm i've never been hunting and like yes i assume 
there's a decent amount of like focus it requires, but I think there's probably also a lot of like downtime where you're just like following the trail or like, oh, maybe it's over here. Okay, be quiet. But there's probably a lot of time for socializing. Yeah, it's kind of like a projection of like John Wayne's stoicism back onto human prehistory with the assumption that like there's very serious, tough, cool guy warriors never j- joked amongst each other or whatever. Right. Yeah, it's just a just so story. And I think no matter what the data showed, you can always construct a story that that justifies it. And I think a good example of this is one of their predictions is that women like to shop new places more than men like to shop new places. Okay. And their justification for this is that sometimes when you're gathering, you need to find new places to gather. Uh Uh-huh. But you never need to find new places to find animals to hunt, obviously. Well, yeah, I think that's a reasonable point, but it's totally... I don't have any excuse for it. It makes no sense. That's kind of my point. So what's happening here, I think, is really clear, which is that they have a stereotype from the modern world about women liking to shop and women like to shop at new places more than men is their hypothesis based on observing the co-eds in the current world. So then they construct a hypothetical historical environment that can justify it loosely, roughly kind of like, yeah, they have to gather new places. That's why they like going to a new shoe store. But if you imagine the data was reversed, like imagine they pull the data and it turns out that men like shopping new places and women want to shop at the same old places while gathering is perennial. So it just makes perfect sense. The bushes are always in the same spot, whereas the zebras move around. Women want to go back and gather at the same spot, but men have to go chase the zebras, so they always like to shop at new places. So anything goes. It's it's all nonsense. It's made up entirely. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, we should say also that when we talk about measuring co-eds now, like, let's think about reasons why, cultural reasons. Let's use the cultural ahead of biological heuristic here. Mm. Is there any cultural reasons why women might have a preference for shopping more than men or a tendency to shop more than men? Well, one of them is that in primary male earning societies where the marketplace and income is coming in through men, the workplace is attended by men five days a week household division of labor women are doing shopping on behalf of the household yeah it's Uh, the type of domestic labor in a patriarchal society would be done by women yeah so then how do we treat children in our society do boys who are being brought along to shop with their mom or girls who are being shopped along with their mom what messages are they getting about shopping as their cognition is forming in relation so this is like the classic feminist critique of socialization and it provides a perfect explanation for why there would be gaps in co-ed data You can disagree with it or not. Maybe there's details that are missing out. There's an interplay between the evolutionary and the political here. They they say in this study, our hypotheses were basically right. Our assumptions that women were going to shop like gatherers was proven out by the data. There was a there was a strong correlation. And the data again being all these little points that you've just sort of laid out. Yeah. So I think the strongest thing was that the largest effect size were that women preferred shopping for fun on average. They preferred shopping with friends on average compared to men. And they demonstrated gathering skills. Which an example that I recorded of what that was was I make a note where something is to return to it when it's on sale. Which women were more likely to do than men apparently. You said, wait, you said women are more likely to want to shop with friends? Yeah. But I thought that was part of hunting behavior, that you wanted to get all your friends together to... That just two different contexts, they're kind of arguing the same thing yeah, would be it, proof of either one, depending on what you want to... I, I guess, or maybe it was specifically shopping for something big. I can't, oh, oh, shopping for something big with your friends is hunting. Versus shopping for socialization. Right, Okay. I guess I would want to bring a friend if I was buying something like like a giant TV I couldn't lift by myself. But even then, someone at the store will like help load it into your car. <laughs> I was thinking if something could be so big, I would want other people to come shopping with me. Uh, <laughs> and there was a medium effect size for object-oriented navigation. So women navigating by landmarks more than men to a moderate degree in terms of the data and also liking to shop new places there was a moderate correlation there as well and so they say that this is this yeah that's not that data to me does not add up to women are biologically into shopping because it's the same as foraging yeah well the big thing is they say that this proves their theory of history and it just obviously doesn't it's like basic logic is like if x then y 
And you read this and they just keep on jumping to these crazy conclusions where there's no logical process at all. It's like genuine non sequiturs. And this is a scientific paper. And they're like, therefore, we have proven that this, this historical context gave ra- rise to the genetic preferences and shopping and so on. Actually, at one point, they say we don't rule out cultural impacts here, but we think the ultimate cause is evolutionarily. So it's just to hand them a little bone that they at least know to say that. They can't rule out that <laughs> social causes right. could impact this. But... I'm reading this and I'm like, you did not prove that at all. Like you proved that women like to shop with their friends more than men on average in the current day. That's all you proved. Like right. within a certain demographic at a certain time in history. <laughs> There's like, like a percentage preference difference there. Yeah. Yeah. And like, yeah, both like it, but there's a strong statistical tendency towards women over men, according to this. Like there's no attempt at all to prove what history was like or prove the genetic basis of this or prove an evolutionary pressure that could lead to it or to even draw a comparison to another animal in nature and say there's a principle here, which is like relatively weak in terms of evidence, like hard evidence, but it's a it's a correlation that can help build an argument. This is just polling data of co-eds about shopping preferences where the questions are stilted and asked in a weird way to reflect perceptions about what hunting and gathering were like. The majority of its claims come in this long, effectively evidenceless historical preamble, which frames the study and is built entirely on stereotypes about people today. So they cite other studies, but then the other studies are just like this. They assume all this weird stuff, and then they prove something narrow about how people answer surveys, and they link all these studies together, and it seems like there's this big evidence base for it. And I was looking at these citations and like reading a little bit and stuff, and it's all just the same type of shit, and it's all just like reinforcing each other, and there's no evidence for these core claims at all. So what happens here, and what happens in EvoPsych in general, is people take political perceptions about the world today, they project it onto history, they create a framework that justifies their perceptions about today based on that imagined history, that history that never actually happened, that's built on their perceptions of today. Then they ask questions about today to the people of today based on their observations of today, and then say, ah, therefore my theory of history is proven. Right. The one that was built on projecting what I had already observed, which I then proved that my observations have statistical basis, Yeah. And they say like, oh, we're proving we made a prediction and the prediction was accurate. We predicted in survey data that it would skew this way because so it lends credence to our theory of what happened in the past, uh, which is a semi valid way. It is a valid way to do science. But if you can make the same prediction based on a different theory, the cultural theory, and the same survey result coming up would prove that theory as well. It would lend credence to that theory. So if you can do it with two completely different base theories, you need to then get a way to distinguish between them, which survey data doesn't do. Yeah, so they, they keep on coming up with more of this shit. There's like new wild studies like this being published all the time. They all link to each other. There's millions of them, hundreds of them more accurately, maybe thousands. But hopefully these heuristics help you to navigate in the future to understand the bullshit that people are feeding to us, this patriarchal naturalism, this assumption that the domination of women is natural and biological. Uh, These are ideas that go back before the advent of psychology, before the advent of evolution. Uh, These are things that have been claimed by societies that dominate women for thousands of years. And sociobiology and evolutionary psychology are in the business of naturalizing patriarchy, which is a multi-thousand year pursuit. And that was Frontiers of Evolutionary Psychology. So yeah, David Buss, he was on Joe Rogan, Huberman, and I was excited to see he was on Jordan Peterson's podcast and they're really vibing with each other. Let's hit a clip from that episode, Peterson and Buss, talking about a classic Evo Psych study. Uh, so men have a much greater desire for meaning a variety of sex partners than women do. And so I'll, I'll just give you one experiment. This is a classic study done by Elaine Hatfield and Russell Clark, where they had male and female confederates simply walk up to members of the opposite sex on a college campus and say, hi, I've been noticing you around campus lately. 
I find you very attractive. Would you, and they asked them one of three questions, would you go on a date with me tonight? Would you come back to my apartment with me? Would you have sex with me? And it was a between groups design. So they simply recorded the percentage of individuals who agreed to these three different requests. And of the women, about half, about a little over 50% agreed to go out on a date with the guy. Uh, 6% agreed to go back to his apartment. 0% agreed to have sex with him. Most women need a little more information about the guy before they're willing to have sex. Of the men approach, also about 50, by the female confederate, about 50% agreed to go out on the date. 69% agreed to go back to her apartment. And 75% agreed to have sex with her. And so if you talk about choosiness, are you willing to have sex with a total stranger who you've met for 30 seconds? Women unwilling to, and in general, uh, men very willing to. And this is a study that's been replicated now in several European studies. Very difficult to do this, as you might imagine, to get this by the IRBs or ethics committees in, in the United States anyway. I assume it's similar in Canada. Or uh, worse. In, yeah, yeah. The kinds of studies we really want to do are more difficult to do nowadays. But and you can get women off of the zero percent. You can get a few percent of the women saying yes if the guy's really, really charming. You know, if he's a uh, Brad Pitt or, or I don't know what the modern equivalent is, Ryan Gosling or one of the, or, or perhaps a famous rock star. Yeah, this, I've heard of this study before. I don't understand why they think they're measuring desire for sex, like a base raw animal desire for sex and not a sort of socially contingent desire for sex based on like social mores. Uh, he says like they've replicated it across different cultures or whatever, Europe and America, which I guess is fair enough. There's a kind of different cultures and also pretty similar cultures, but also like it's totally possible in my mind that a lot of these women did want to have sex with the men who approached them, but decided not to because it would be less wise for them. And they're, they're like more concerned about their safety than men are. And it has nothing to do with a desire for sex, but more with different inhibiting factors being present for women than men. Cause I don't know, I've known women in my life and they want to have sex with different men plenty like they if you get them to talk about it they'll they'll admit there's lots of different men i might like to have sex with yeah i also i'm really curious on what scientific basis dr bus can say that women's percentage for having sex with a total stranger will go up if they're perhaps a rock star or ryan gosling i mean ryan gosling Maybe Ryan Gosling, you know, he's always doing quirky stuff. Maybe he participated in the study. Uh, right. Just like we're going to find the upper level of how many people have random sex on the street. I mean, yeah, uh, maybe some of those European studies, there was like one or two percent of women said yes. And so he's reading into that. Oh, the men must have been so charming. They were like basically like rock stars. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe he's just making shit up. Yeah, that, that flow from like data into anecdote is it's the classic bus move across all of these things. He'll be like, hey, you know, I even know a guy and this guy <laughs> said this. And it's like, uh, OK, well, I thought we were expressing like uh, hard scientific facts that they don't want you to hear. Yeah, I, get, I feel like he's almost preemptively because he's like, oh, people are going to bring up like, oh, what about, you know, women who will just have sex with rock stars at the backstage of a show or something like that? Like some idea he has about some situation where so he has to like say, oh, maybe in this one time women will say yes. But I, I don't know what he's basing that on. Yeah, I think he's just basing it on just being this one particular guy's like kind of opinion about like women, you know, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he's passing it off as he's he's talking about his kind of like, you know, old guy, general stereotype about w women that he carries in his head. And this survey done on college students in a few different countries or su survey is not even the right word. Social experiment, I guess. Or like yeah, there's some like there's so many variations in that, too, of like we could we could think through of like how what it would take to actually do a version of that that doesn't have like weird confounding biases. But I think the whole threat of violence and stranger danger and stuff and also the cultural you know, anti-sexual norms towards women. You know, there's some study cited in, in this book I read, um, The Age of Scientific Sexism, but she was citing Sex at Dawn, uh, who she also criticized. They cite a study, so now I'm citing that study 
three citations deep. But it showed that women would admit to having more sexual partners if they believed they were being subjected to a lie detector test on average. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, so, like, th- there's an average answer for how many previous sexual partners you had, and then women think that they're being monitored by a lie detector that... I mean, that study, we don't, we don't need that study to, to know that there's like a culture of like prudishness around what is expected of women compared to men. The gap between women. how society currently views these things is pretty significant. Yeah, yeah. Men are praised for having multiple sexual partners and women are shamed for it. So like, yeah, that's a big part of it. And also to be fair. Fair to them, I guess, because this result is a bit more substantial than a lot of the sort of survey results EvoCite gets, like 75% of men saying yes and 0% of women. That's like, that's a big difference. A lot of these things, you know, like 51% one way, 49% the other way, but this is pretty big. So like, I could see it being true that certain hormones are more likely to make someone more interested in a quick hookup. Like maybe having more testosterone in your body just makes you a bit more willing to do that could be part of the number. I don't know if we know that for sure, but it seems at least possible based on what I've heard from people who change the dominant hormone in their body, uh, sort of the changes trans people discuss when that when that happens. Like there could be something there, but like I think the dismissal of any cultural factors is like just wrong yeah i think it's also worth saying i've i've also read um stuff from trans men and adjusting to like having a heightened sex drive from yeah or even trans women saying like it's different like my sex drive my horniness is different now that i'm on estrogen it's less this sort of immediate wanting like, yeah i don't know people have different experiences too like not everyone reports these things they're kind of like trends but not like every time or whatever yeah, and being in multiple s- different countries and cultures for a study like this is a, it's a good thing. But it's important to remember also that just because something is found in multiple cultures doesn't mean that it's like an innate inherited characteristic that has spread around the world to all these different cultures or something like that. Like a good example, I saw someone give this example somewhere, is like business suits culturally have traveled all around the world. That anywhere you go in the world wearing a, a suit jacket, a tie it's a sign. It's a sign that you want to participate in trade, uh, that you're a professional, et cetera. The suit jacket, you could do surveys of different countries and see that suit jackets all, are all over the world. But we know for a fact that suit jackets are a very recent phenomenon in global history, a couple hundred years at most. Suit jackets aren't an evolved trait. They're a cultural trait. And seeing them around in different parts of the world doesn't mean that we evolved a gene for wanting to wear suit jackets. We recently published a study on 14 different cultures on the sex differences and similarities. Uh, And indeed, there are differences. So even things like physical attractiveness, it increases both male and female status, but it increases female status more than male status. Uh, Why? Well, what we argue is that, and this is one thing my 37 culture study showed, is that men place a greater priority on physical attractiveness, physical appearance, good looks, and it's not an arbitrary social construction. It's, it's basically an evolved preference for fertility cues. Men who mated with infertile women failed to become ancestors and who are all descendants. Well, Buss's 37 culture study, uh, we talked about this in the last episode, but uh, we should just emphasize it. It doesn't really show what he says it's showing. He's saying that it shows that men like certain things and women like certain things and that holds across cultures. And that's just really not true. The 37 culture study, it showed that there's far more consensus between men and women about what they find attractive in the opposite sex, straight men and women. In some cases, there's a small difference of priority. That is men in general ranking something higher in general than women rank it. But those findings, because it's a multiculture study, we know that the gap on those things was smaller in countries that had more egalitarian gender norms, which indicates that the vast majority of or almost all of that variability is cultural. That's what his study shows. That's the study that he's citing as evidence of these innate different preferences between men and women. First of all, their general tendencies. Second of all, the tendencies aren't even that big. And third of all, the data actually shows that it's cultural and not biological. 
it's the same thing with a lot of these like if it's a biological trait why does it show up as 51 percent or like a slight men perf- we both like looks but men look at looks slightly more women look at status slightly more it's like you would expect if it was ingrained in biology that it would show up cross cultures yes in like a very strong way so he does an interesting rhetorical thing which is he says This isn't an arbitrary preference. This is an evolutionary strategy. But he doesn't at all explain how a survey could connect to that hypothesis. We're talking about ancient history. Yeah, it's like, but the very best, if this was found across all cultures and it was a strong difference, the best possible version of the evidence would only be one piece of evidence in favor of this maybe being the explanation. But to say that, like, small differences found between men and women across most cultures means that it's definitely evolutionary. It just makes no sense at all. Yeah. And as part of claiming that this is an objective science that can help improve your life and your relationships. Yeah. What's the improvement of your life and relationships for this? Like women focus more on your looks and men focus more on gaining resources or something. If you want to get a mate I don't think that that's like very good advice on how to get a mate. Yeah, what's natural isn't good, but I'm going to share with you today some science that can help you to, that you can apply to your life. But like also like, because in other times they'll say that men are way less choosy than women. That's like a big Evo psych thing. So if men are less choosy than women, but they value attractiveness in women more than women value attractiveness in men, like... There's kind of like mixed signals there in terms of like, if you're a woman turning to David Buss for dating advice, should you focus on attractiveness because men value it more? Or should you not worry about attractiveness that much because men aren't that choosy? Oh, there's another one of those contradictions that I notice Because w- w- when he was talking about the cost of child rearing, men and their attractiveness and their the attractiveness numbers that they evolutionarily assign to women of uh, scale one to 10 kids effectively downgrade it. Uh, But also men have a deep drive to reproduce with as many people as possible with low parental investment. So like, why would you evolutionarily care about the cost of a kid that you evolutionarily want to abandon? Right, right, right. Yeah, no, it it makes no sense. But Jordan Peterson and David Buss didn't just talk about some of the standout studies, which were basically surveying people in the current day and then projecting it onto history. They also went in to talk a little bit about social theories. Like I said, they were really seeming to vibe. And there was a couple times in the episode where they veered into the subject of patriarchy. Uh, Goaded on by Jordan Peterson, David Buss shared some of his theories on what patriarchy is and how it functions and what the people who believe in patriarchy tend to think and feel. Uh, Let's go into it. And so why why isn't it sufficient to say, like the sort of more modern blank slate theorists might, that patriarchy is a sufficient explanation for the difference in mating strategies across the sexes, and that the reason that polyandry is so uncommon is because women have, are dominated by men everywhere, and that's arbitrary and an expression of power. It has nothing to do with our central biological tendency. Okay, that's a really interesting question, and I have a couple of different thoughts uh, on it. First of all, the question the first question is like what does one mean by patriarchy and if you get into if you get into it and and i've asked people who invoke those sort of explanations well what do you mean by patriarchy and usually that causes them to stumble and mumble around well and they just know well patriarchy is though it's self-explanatory well it's not self-explanatory because they're if you break it down analytically you can identify different components so is it the case that men worldwide tend to have more resources, more economic resources than women on average? Well, the answer is is yes. But then even if you take that component of what's called patriarchy, you can ask the question, well, how did it come to pass that across all cultures or nearly all cultures, men on average have more resources? Well, as one biological anthropologist, I think this was Irv DeVore at Harvard, he said, men are one long breeding experiment run by women. You know, basically one of the things that one of my first studies, the 37 culture study documented is that women have a universal preference for men with resources. Uh, And so that sets up a co-evolutionary process whereby those men who were chosen as mates tended to be motivated 
and have the ability and willingness to acquire resources yeah, and so, share. Yeah, it's interesting because they, they start out kind of like saying, why isn't patriarchy sufficient to explain these differences? But it just kind of veers very quickly into saying, at least if we take this one example of what they'll say is patriarchy, that's actually real. It's just natural. And like it, it comes from evolution. It's not culturally contingent. They're not in that clip. And the specific aspect of patriarchy he focuses on, he's not saying it's not true. He's just saying it's natural and fundamental, or it's like deep evolutionary part of us rather than something we can change. Like Peterson even says it in the way he frames the question. He's like, what would you say to people who claim that they, these things happen because women are dominated by men and that's arbitrary and an expression of power? He didn't seem to be disputing that women are dominated by men. He's disputing that it's arbitrary. It's just interesting. It's like framing it as like an alternative way of viewing the world from patriarchy, but it's not actually doing that. It's just justifying patriarchy. Yeah. As they continue to talk about patriarchy, I think he demonstrates some more misunderstandings roughly about what it stands for. But you're right. He basically concedes one of the major claims of patriarchy theory, but just says effectively, this is the natural order of things. So to criticize it is ridiculous or that it's not a merely contingent social arrangement where women have less rights than men are sexually repressed and so on. It's actually encoded in our genes like a recipe and we are bound to it. We are shackled to it in history. Whether we like it or not, this sort of behavior is very effective. Yeah. And it's like, oh, the other thing is like, well, I just watched the movie Little Women the other day. One of the major themes of the movie is that like it's really hard for women to earn money and like one of the main characters is like a self-insert of the writer who wrote the book and she wants to be a writer but it's difficult to be a writer as a woman because they don't take you seriously or they want all every story has to end with the woman getting married and stuff there's like why would you need to socially enforce these things and prevent women from earning resources in the marketplace, which historically in like capitalist patriarchy has been a thing where like, it's not just that women have always, it's always been open to women, but they just decide not to earn as much as men, or they're not as driven to it as the men. If that was the case, and it was just inborn and biological, why would we need all these social structures enforcing it on women? And why in like the modern day when like workplaces have been opened up to women, universities have been opened up to women, are women like really excelling at things like academia? They're really excelling at things that earning, there's certain populations in the United States where women are out earning men. Like I think it was young women versus young men in particular metropolitan areas, the young women are out earning the young men. And just like if this was an, an evolutionary thing, you wouldn't think that was possible. Yeah, and it's funny because the polling, the polling that they used to project on prehistory, some of this stuff is just like asking, they ask everyone, hey, is it a plus if the person that you're considering dating for the long term has a lot of resources? And like everyone generally says yes, everyone generally agrees. Like that's a plus, right. yeah. that's cool. But then it's like, oh, well, three percent less men say that's a not plus. a plus, right? <laughs> right. Uh, or yeah, or three percent less men put it put that below something else, depending on the the structure of the study. Yeah. Um, Again, these tiny differences. Yeah. I just thought we should say a few more words about your question about patriarchy. What I started with is that, you know, you have to break it down into analytically into precisely what causal process you're invoking. And usually when people invoke it, it's like this um, mysterious uh, causal force in the ether that somehow comes down and infects people's minds. Um, and they don't get into the question of, well, what are the causal origins of what you're calling patriarchy, you know? And, and to get to that, you have to get to things like female mate preferences and the co-evolution of those mate preferences with male mating strategies. The part of male mating strategies is to prioritize resource acquisition and clawing their way up the status hierarchy and selling their grandmother to, to, to get ahead. And studies of this gets to another sex difference that women tend to allocate their time, energy, and investment across a wider array of, you know, what we call adaptive problems. So women more than men invest in kin. Even if they're married, they invest more in their in-laws, in their friendships, et cetera. And men, on average, tend to be more monomaniacal about getting ahead. 
So, so uh, you could yeah. say you could say the most effective long-term strategy for smashing the patriarchy is for women to select low-ranking mates to sleep with. <laughs> uh, yes. So if you, if you <laughs> I should get, get in they, lots of trouble for that. <laughs> well, well, if women changed their mate preferences so that they didn't care about status and resources and uh, those or those qualities, and you iterated that over enough generations, yeah, it would it would ultimately change male behavior. Scientist David Buss. <laughs> you can see they're really vibing, as I said. Like yeah. they're sort of, they're picking up on each other's stuff. I think they're both fans of each other. I've I've noticed this actually with a lot of these. I was listening to Randy Thornhill, who I have clips. I don't have clips from this interview because it was the one of the less interesting ones. But he was talking with Gad Sad, who's another one of these Evo Psych academic slash pundit people. But anyway, he was like they had a very similar vibe of like, oh, I'm gonna get in trouble for saying this, but Mm, I was going <laughs> to do it anyway. But like also, okay, so the beginning of this clip, he's saying patriarchy, they never talk about what causes it. It's just this amorphous causal thing. Like how does yeah, it happen? No, it comes down from the ether and infects people's <laughs> minds. I can't, these patriarchy theorists have such an unrealistic view of the world. The <laughs> way they like insist like, that patriarchy comes from the ether and infects people's minds. Yeah, it's like they never locate it in culture and history coming from a particular historical movement and cultural ideas that have been passed down through generations. And like, no, there's no like causal chain proposed at all in terms of those things. Yeah. yeah I like don't know how... if you're saying, or if you're saying any cultural historical explanation is insufficient unless you're ultimately bringing it back to biology in some way. Like it just seems like such a straw man to say that there's no, causal explanation for patriarchy when so much of the literature on patriarchy is based on reading history, reading philosophy, reading like our cultural past and explaining patriarchy as a function of th these things, a these ideologies <laughs> that get passed on. Yeah, I would say that like the formation history and like composition of patriarchy is uh, one of the primary focuses of <laughs> <laughs> patriarchy theory. Yeah. Oh, David Anecdote Bus is telling a story of a time when he talked to an individual who couldn't explain, was invoking patriarchy <laughs> without being able to explain it. But he represents that as the entire field of thinking and talking about patriarchy is incapable of explaining its own claims. Yeah, it gets into this female mate choice thing. Like, men, like well, that's, women... the, that's the insane. That's like that's Jordan Peterson when he's like fallen off the chair, kind of <laughs> wild brain. It, it reminds me of Stefan Molyneux, who really likes to blame everything bad men do on their mothers. It's like one of his big things. Uh, yeah. And it's like Peterson does that too. And it's... women are choosing bad men. And then so that makes more bad men or, you know, quote unquote, bad men. patriarchal men, let's say women are women are creating patriarchy because they keep choosing patriarchal men. It just seems like a way to shift the focus away from men's behavior, like making all of men's behaviors a function of female choice is just essentially victim blaming. Like if we're talking about patriarchy and we're saying that women have been a victim, historically speaking, of not having their equal human rights respected, to just hand wave that away into, well, you're the one who's choosing the men. Like it's such like, it's such a political rhetorical, like nah, you move and not a scientific explanation for human behavior, for why this phenomenon existed, for why men behave this way. It's like, you can tell that story, but we don't have like evidence that that's the reason men act patriarchally. Well, the, yeah, and the jump from the contemporary survey data that's hard to do because of increasing ethics concerns and the historic hypothesis that patriarchy is effectively caused by women evolutionarily that is a in the context of someone who is representing a field of science claiming to the evidence gap there is very formidable yeah that survey data is just as easily explained by the idea that there's been a historical development of patriarchy that has spread through the globe and created pervasive cultural norms across the planet then you do surveys and you find that people have these attitudes like, that's just completely consistent with the idea of patriarchy as a culturally contingent thing. 
The idea that people have patriarchal attitudes isn't evidence that patriarchy is biological. Let's hear one more time from Professor David Buss, who, sorry, can we just play quickly Huberman on him again? <laughs> I'm certain that everyone will take away extremely valuable knowledge that they can use in existing or future relationships about the real science of human mate selection from this discussion with Dr. Buss. Thank you, Andrew Huberman. Okay, let's finish, finish what you were saying, Mr. Mr. Buss. With respect to the oppression issue, one of the implicit assumptions of people who invoke patriarchy as an explanation is that they assume that men are somehow united in their interests as a group in oppressing women as a group. Okay, and from an evolutionary perspective, mm -hmm. that can't occur because men are primarily in competition with other men, not with other women. And also each individual has alliances with some members of our own sex some rivalries with members of our own sex, but also alliances with some members of the opposite sex. So every man has, uh, for example, a mother, sometimes a daughter, a sister, an aunt, a, a niece. And so the notion that men are somehow united in, as a group with a goal of oppressing women as a group, it just can't occur uh, from an evolutionary perspective. He's like taking the way that they see evolutionary th like th his critique of like this straw logic of patriarchy applies to their version of evo psych way better than it applies to how anybody actually thinks about patriarchy like the idea that all men are strategizing to get their seeds into the future and they're all doing this thing they're all subconsciously gaming in this one way is like how they think evolution works it's not how patriarchy, like people with patriarchy don't think all men are like consciously gaming for how to keep women down. It's like there's like implicit beliefs and structures that benefit men. And so men are more likely to like take on these beliefs. But women also perpetuate it and believe these things. It's a pervasive culture that like benefits men in some way, but also hurts men in many ways. Like patriarchy is well established, well thought. Everyone who believes in patriarchy believes that it has negative effects for men as well as for women. It's not this idea that men are all like holding hands in some <laughs> united front against all women. Yeah. And I mean, if you, you can have an alliance with a woman like your mother or your sister or whatever, your daughter, you have an alliance with her. But if you're actually punishing any sort of like political expression, sexual expression, denying the right to like own property, denying the right to participate in democratic processes, denying the right to have your own bank account, treating as subordinate and et cetera, I could go on with this. But having an alliance with someone doesn't necessarily mean they're not your slave just to do the kind of extreme debate bro right, like yeah extreme example to uh make a point or to show the principle yeah demonstrating the principle yeah obviously there are a lot of patriarchal contexts that aren't literal slavery but in other contexts like it is quite slavery -y. i mean women being treated as property is and like being forced is, to do work. Yeah, not having a choice in who you married. It's not only just like slavery, it's like sex yeah, maybe slavery. This isn't it's even, pretty horrible. This isn't even that much of a debate bro -y thing. I'm not even pushing it that far. It's just, a, yeah. it's, a, it's almost a clarifying lens. But anyways, so just because someone's your slave doesn't mean you can't have an alliance with them. And because you have an alliance with them doesn't mean that it's impossible for them to be your slave, where you own them and you have the right to destroy them or whatever, and whatever twisted culture that would be. Right, right. They could yeah, still like be imagine someone who... back in Roman times, you have two warring city-states, and they all have slaves, but like the slaves are fighting on the side of their city-state. Like That doesn't mean there's not a conspiracy by all owners of slaves to make the institution of slavery seem legitimate and necessary uh, just because in this one instance the slaves are fighting with the people because they're like imagining they might be killed if the other side wins or something i don't know it's like these things are contingent they can be overlapping where you have alliances with sisters and things and rivalries with other men but also on another level all men are agreeing to these social norms that disadvantage women it's not a contradiction that both of those could happen at the same time yeah, and I get when you're vibing with Jordan Peterson and you just like, you guys start talking about your shared values, you might slip up and say something slightly unscientific. But 
I felt like this this patriarchy exchange in this interview was really illuminating on like the political perspective of the luminaries of evolutionary psychology, who not only see evolutionary psychology as helpful advice in how to live your life, but also see it as kind of like an oppressed true ideology with a political perspective against the existence of patriarchy or favor of patriarchy to the degree that it can be shown to exist. Right. Um, yeah. And this is the guy that Huberman is, says is going to teach me about my life, how to be a better, healthier person with better relationships. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Teaching Dr. David Buss About Patriarchy. We are your hosts, The Wrong Boys, and we're just going to briefly try to explain patriarchy to Dr. David Buss before he does any further podcast appearances. Yeah, he seems a bit confused about it. He seems to think that people who talk about patriarchy believe that it's a mysterious force in the ether that comes down and infects people's minds. Let's just uh, let's give him a primer on a whole bunch of stuff related to patriarchy. Yeah, so patriarchy as a whole, it's a social system where men enjoy authorities over women, children, and property. There's a hierarchy between men and women where women are assigned more limited social roles to be mother, domestic laborer, and sometimes consumer within a family, where men control property, income, and the women's labor force, and men participate in outside society where the woman's role is domestic. As a result of this, women have more limited political, social, and economic lives than men, have more limited access to education than men, and live under legal and political systems which are designed by men. So that's like the full stripe patriarchy idea, but there's also a gradient that doesn't fully meet all of those criteria where it's used in a broader sense to talk about a variety of systems that all together work for the benefit of men in aggregate against the interests of women in aggregate. And one of the things that includes, that doesn't come from the ether, but is actually transferred socially through culture, is misogynistic attitudes, attitudes of denigration towards women, not reflecting the whole humanity of women and the way that women are spoken about and thought about. It doesn't come from the ether. It's often taught by parents to children or through media and so on. Okay, so my understanding is the term patriarchy started in academic and anthropological context to refer to sort of a full stripe rule of the father type social arrangement. Uh, and it was picked up in the broader sense by the women's movements of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Kate Millett, a feminist author, wrote the book Sexual Politics, which was a major popularizer of the term patriarchy that tries to build an, uh, an overarching critique of patriarchy in society. And she makes a number of points about patriarchy I found compelling. I'll, I'll quote a few here uh, for the benefit of Mr. Buss. She says, a disinterested examination of our system of sexual relationships must point out that the situation between the sexes now and throughout history is a case of dominance and subordination, where men have a birthright priority over women. Every avenue of power in society, including the coercive force of the police, is entirely in male hands. Military, industry, technology, university, science, political office, and finance dominated by men. Men dominate women and the old men dominate the young men. Classically, patriarchy grants the father nearly total ownership over wife or wives and children, including the powers of physical abuse and murder. Patriarchy enforces a temperamental imbalance of personality traits between the sexes. It enforces ignorance upon women, denying them literacy and access to education. And it uses misogynistic literature and comedy to propagandize gender difference and maintain the status of women. It includes with it a kind of patriarchal religion of biological naturalism. It's an ideology that claims that biological differences between men and women justify a political logic of subordination, that it's just natural and biological and not a political decision. So I actually think in terms of her critique of the patriarchal critique of the structure of society and the different advantages given to women versus men and so on is all stuff that I think David Buss would generally agree is happening. Yeah, he just believes the part that she said about, well, she described it as a religion of biological naturalism, that men naturally are a certain way, those personality traits, uh, differences, she said that it is enforced, he would say that it's natural, it's biological, it's evolutionary. So, you know, the basic alternate theory, other than the idea that it's a biological, natural thing, is the idea that this is a political choice and that societies can be organized in a variety of different ways and for a variety of different reasons historically we have typically organized in more patriarchal leaning ways 
often fairly extremely patriarchal ways, but that it's a political choice made by people to continue organizing in that way. And you can kind of see how like, if something like that gets started, there could be a type of momentum to it since the system benefits men in a lot of ways and it puts men in power. So there would be a type of like bias by the people who are in power to keep the system that benefits them and keeps them in power. You would have a tendency to want to believe that it's inherent, that it's biological, that it's natural, that it's maybe ordained by God, uh, that it should be this way. And so therefore, there are cultural reinforcement mechanisms saying we have to keep doing this because it should be this way because it biologically is or because god said that it is that it's the natural order of things and so therefore we enforce that on kids there's cultural transmission we're teaching them our values we enforce it on women who step out of line we enforce it on men who step out of line and don't play this game there's a cultural inertia that continues to keep these systems in place. It's not coming down from the ether. It's not actually hard to imagine how a thing like this could happen. If you put a certain group of people in charge, equip them with an ideology that says they should be in charge or that it's natural for them to be in charge, it makes sense that they would you know, continue to propagate that idea. Yeah, and it's not that all men are conspiring and working together actively against all women. That's not what patriarchy theory sort of asserts. It's not about individual small-scale conspiracies. It's about a systemic sort of threading of all of these different types of logic that come out of this hierarchical conception of men versus women. There's, a, there's an ideology to it on one hand, and then there's also social relations that are related to it as well, structures and institutions that prioritize men over women, and the two things working together. So if you want to ask, like, what are the causal forces today in the world? I know that was one of your questions, Bus. Causally, in the current day, one of the things that causes patriarchy to be continually reinforced is institutions that were formed with patriarchal norms and assumptions that still persist today, institutions that have biases towards men over women in various ways, uh, including some cultural institutions that we take for granted, and also misogynistic attitudes and patriarchal attitudes, chauvinist attitudes about differences between men and women, including the biological naturalism that bus, unfortunately, you are replicating in your podcast appearances. So... If we want to talk about causally where that's coming from today, there's existing institutions that persist, new institutions that reinforce these ideologies and ideas, and then there's also ideas of patriarchy, assumptions of patriarchy, and they are perpetuated culturally, like Aaron said. Yeah, and I think also he might say like, okay, that could explain like current day, when he said causality or like, it's kind of unclear whether he's talking about like what causes it to continue or like where did it come from originally, if it didn't come from our biology. He conflates the two because his explanation is this biologically deterministic. The answer to both those questions is the same thing, which is right. that men and women are wired in this way, this slightly antagonistic way that created this dynamic. His answer to both those questions is the same answer, but our answer slightly different, although it's overlapping. Yeah, I think in terms of like what caused it in history, I don't think there's like one. We don't have that fine grained detail about whether patriarchy just came about once and spread across the world or whether it came to be multiple times in multiple different contexts. That tends to be what I would think that like different societies would organize themselves in different ways. We have instances of societies that weren't organized in patriarchal ways. So, you know, it probably happened in various ways in various times in various cultures, but as a sort of global culture grew, it spread. But there, there's also like various different theories about that. Yeah, like this is this is an area of patriarchy studies that is well trodden, that this, this, is, this is a debate that people have. Yeah, I've seen theories about patriarchy coming about at the same time as agriculture. I think that's actually not well supported by archaeological evidence, but it is a theory that's out there that once we had agriculture, that brings about private property because there's all this excess crops and you store it for the next year and then people start amassing large amounts of wealth. So the idea goes and then that sort of breaks apart more tribal property norms where things are shared amongst the group. You have individuals hoarding a lot of resources who want to pass those resources down onto their 
children, that causes men to be a lot more particular about wanting it to be their kid. And so there's like a incentive there to control the reproductive capacity of women. I've also seemed it framed similarly that just the spreading of people into various households based on family lines and lineages uh, often led to women being the people who left their home to go and live with their husband's family. And so that led to a type of women being treated as a type of property that was traded amongst men similar to other types of property. I've also seen the theory that the rise of states and higher, large hierarchical systems of organization caused the men at the very, very top of hierarchical systems to demand more reproductive control over the women in their states because they want soldiers. So they need, a lot of people are being killed in wars and the need to control reproductive capacity of women in order to have as many babies as possible to make more soldiers. Uh, so there's another theory of how it could have started. One that I encountered, there's actually a book called The Creation of Patriarchy by Gerda Lerner. Her speculation about the origins of patriarchy is that she cites in particular the, the practice of, in a military conflict, killing all of the men and then taking the women as slaves or taking the women as wives as a potential origin point for patriarchal dynamics within cultures, because you have this subordinate class of women who are captured instead of killed in a military conflict. So this is, this is one particular institutional trajectory where the logic of patriarchy could be learned from this emergent process of capturing enemy soldiers' wives as slaves, which is a historical practice with a lot of evidence in different cultures. I've seen it also suggested that the origins of private property could be correlated with the origins of the subordination of women, with women being turned into a type of property, intersecting with some of the dynamics that you talked about. I think in all these cases, Nancy Fulbra in her book, The Rise and Decline of Patriarchal Systems, said something interesting, uh, which is that patriarchy and authoritarian modes of government seem to have co-evolved, and that instead of thinking of each of these historical processes like uh, racism, colonialism, the rise of like dominant states as all being these like distinct waves that uh, replace the previous one, paraphrasing a bit here, but instead they could be seen as basically extensions of uh, logic of domination that was first trialed on women historically, understood through the process of enslaving women, through the, the keeping of women as subordinate housewives and so on sort of misogynist subordination of women is the trial run, the nucleus of the logic of domination, which was then applied through a variety of different logics over history. That's one particular theory about the origin. But I think that uh, just to return to the book Sexual Politics and Kate Millett, I should emphasize actually that sexual politics, the rise and decline of patriarchal system and the creation of patriarchy all explicitly address hierarchical naturalism patriarchal naturalism, the idea of biological and evolutionary explanations for this sort of stuff. So Mr. Buss, if you're not familiar with the debates on this, these statements you're making are out of line with, these are all very like mainstream and notable books on the subject of patriarchy. They address these arguments very, very directly. They talk about this naturalist stuff very, very directly. And their consensus is that these are very old ideas about women being naturally inferior that have existed from before the advent of the idea of evolution, before the advent of the idea of psychology. And they take an explicit skepticism to the idea that there's something innate and natural about biological differences causing patriarchy, although they happily concede that there are differences between men and women on average and that those differences may have played a role in the development of patriarchy in history. All three of them say, sure, maybe. Yeah, even if you say men are stronger than women, they're still like, they have to decide to use that strength to oppress women. Like, yeah, that's a choice. That's, that's, exactly, that's almost exactly what Kate Millett says in the book, is like, even if men are stronger than women and the strength of men is what one of the root causes of patriarchy, the strength over women, there still has to be a time where new information or new cultural change causes men to think differently about their relationship to women and then to enact those thoughts on them through institutions. So it's a political choice. 
The feminist consensus is it's not biological. Even if it has some biological aspect to it or crumb of biology to it, it is ultimately a political choice. They address you pretty much directly, Mr. Buss. Like, Dr. Buss, they're subtweeting you. Next time you talk to Jordan Peterson, please, Dr. Buss, you should be informed. Please read these three books. It's not very many books for an adult man. And even if you don't want to read the books, just like if nothing else, if nothing else, instead of mysterious force in the ether that comes down and infects people's minds, change, swap that out for a political choice. The alternative to my theory that it comes from biology is that it's a political choice that people make because we know that humans are capable of arranging their cultures in a wide variety of ways, both highly patriarchal and highly non-patriarchal ways. We've seen this throughout anthropological and archaeological history. There's evidence of these things. So they believe that it's a choice. That's what you would say. They don't believe it's a magic thing that infects people's minds. They believe that it's a choice that has been made in history and continues to be made in various ways. Not a choice, but you know, a, an accumulation of many, many micro choices ongoing to continue to perpetuate this system. Even if you can just get that one thing through your head, I feel like it would just really uplift your understanding, your analysis of patriarchy. Absolutely. And I'll give the last word here again to, to Kate Millett. Uh, she says that on the historical origins of patriarchy, it's probably unanswerable whether patriarchy originated primordially in male strength or whether patriarchy originated from a later mobilization of that strength under certain circumstances. Uh, she makes clear across the book that she endorses that view. And I quote, Whatever real differences between the sexes may be, we're not likely to know them until the sexes are treated differently. That is, alike. That is far from being the case at the present. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Buss, for listening. And thank you for learning, Dr. Buss, and in integrating, most of all. We now go to Dr. David Buss, at home, at night, tossing and turning in bed. David, David, what is it? What... What's what's keeping you up? Uh, I just keep on thinking about what Sean and Aaron on the Seriously Wrong podcast said on, in their second episode about evolutionary psychology. They're right. There's some major, major issues and weird assumptions in my work. I, like Some of it just needs to be thrown out. Oh, David, don't listen to them. They're, you're a published scientist, well-cited, well-respected. They're just podcasters. They're, they're dilettante suits. <sighs> yeah, you're probably right, but... What if they're iconoclastic autodidacts? What if they're right? Oh, David, I wouldn't worry about that. Just just go back to sleep. Yeah, no, it's... It'll all be better in the morning. That's probably nothing. It's, yeah, it's, it's fine. Probably wrong. They're probably seriously wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's the name of the show, if you, didn't, if you haven't checked it out yet. Oh, no, I listen all the time. Yeah, it's good. I like the mix. It's a good mix. I do like the mix. Good night. Good night. So we wanted to move, uh, so we're going to move away from Dr. Buss for a minute and listen to a few other evolutionary psychologists. This clip here is a short one. It's a bit, it's kind of just goofy. It's Jeffrey Miller on the Dave Rubin show. And in general, I think Jeffrey Miller, at least in the appearances I saw, he was on best behavior. Um, but this clip stood out to me, not because of how horrifying it is, but just because of how how it demonstrates the way that this way of thinking just becomes this absurd lens that is used to look at every single aspect of someone's life. I think for young single people, what we call mating effort, like the attempt to attract other people, whatever your sexual orientation, that drives an awful lot of behavior. How you dress, what I ideas you adopt, um, why you bother to learn things, why you bother to get credentials. I think a lot of that is driven by mating effort. But then if you settle down and you're in a long-term monogamous relationship, you don't kind of need to do that stuff. But that's exactly when people get lazy. Go, huh? That's where people let themselves go, right? They don't stay in shape. They dress more sloppily. They kind of don't bother reading serious nonfiction anymore. Mm -hmm. Why? Because a lot of that sort of creative display has already accomplished its, its purpose. 
it's such a good example of the way that they turn everything into being about mating because that's what evolutionary psychology is about sexual selection and like but like making the statement that people don't pursue like another degree or they like stop reading nonfiction because it's like part of letting yourself go is you like people move through different stages of life and maybe once you have a degree you actually don't need another one if you have like a comfortable life and a good job and like you're doing different things like the idea that every single behavior or non-behavior has to do with like a mating display it can get pretty horrifying but here it's just like really goofy like it's a goofy way to think that that's why people are doing these things it's not to say that there's no context in which wanting to have romantic relationships or impress people could never play into like any sort of action that people take but reducing Everything that people do, any sort of self-actualization or self-improvement to always being a mating effort display that just from 100 to zero disappears once they get into a settled relationship. And I, I'm, we talked about this on the show before. I like to read nonfiction. Nonfiction is the books that I read all the time. Right. Uh, there's no... There's nothing, yeah. <laughs> there's nothing horny about it. There's no, it's, I just enjoy I assume it. that you've stopped recently since you've made it successfully. You have a kid now. Uh, you just like, mm, don't care about it anymore. I was only trying to impress. No, it's sincerely, <laughs> it really is sincerely an interest. Like, you know, when someone plays golf or they like to play video games. Oh, or yeah, those like, are all mating strategies, right? <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I like it gives me um, we all have things that we do like that we feel like ourself when we're doing it. And for me, it's partially identity maintenance, partially trying to enrich myself by understanding more things. But when I'm sitting with my book and I'm highlighting, I'm not trying to send mixed messages to anyone. I'm not <laughs> I'm not I'm not doing that to, to flirt with the universe. It's something I actually enjoy. Yeah, people have genuine interests, like news, because he could have said like, oh, there's a part, like maybe part of the reason people want to get degrees or that they don't do these things is because they have less of this drive to impress other people. Like maybe that's like an element of reason though, like that's why. That's why they stop. That's why like, people get degrees to get accredited for careers. And so like, obviously yeah, and then you that's have a the... <laughs> career. You don't need to go get another degree. Like you're busy doing Bro, your I career. I fell in love when I was 13. So I never went to college. I, <laughs> I just had no reason to. Yeah. There was no point in impressing uh, anyone after that. So. Trade school to become a plumber, but I'm, I'm already married. What are you talking about? <laughs> Fuck out of here with that bullshit. It's our new catchphrase on the show. So before we keep going, I just wanted to mention quickly that the next clips that we have, there's some Randy Thornhill clips that I'm going to play next, and we have one more David Buss and Huberman clip for the end as well. And for these clips, we're going to go to some darker places than we have previously. Uh, so yeah, if you don't feel like listening to Apologia for Sexual Assault, Rape, and Domestic Violence, uh, be forewarned. Uh, that's where we're headed here. So first up, we have some clips of Randy Thornhill, who wrote a discredited book in the 1990s about the evolutionary psychology of rape, and who I mentioned was on with Gad Sad, uh, laughing about, you know, getting in trouble for saying things. They stayed away from this topic, but I did find him on a very recent interview um, repeating a lot of the discredited ideas from his book. Yes, and uh, and females or women in this case are very prone to suffer from uh, an episode of rape because they are also not able to choose a good mate and most of the time men who rape won't even invest in the offspring, right? Yes, yes indeed. So what sexual coercion, rape, intimidation, harassment, whatever kind of sexual coercion it is, does very fundamentally is circumvent female mate and sire choice. That's a fundamental motivational pursuit of uh, femininity, to get a good mate, a male, high genetic quality of providing male, and sexual coercion circumvents that and hence reduces female fitness. And that's fundamentally why there is so much concern uh, about, about sexual coercion. So if the male get sexual access by coercion, then there's no male investment. And that is, is uh, very important for 
female reproductive success, getting male investment in her and her and her offspring. So uh, hence females uh, don't want to be raped. They have lots of uh, mechanisms to reduce the probability of rape and to uh, deal with it when it has occurred. And um, that shows the importance of, of uh, sexual coercion in human evolutionary history. It documents that females are adapted to deal with the problem of rape. Okay, so there's so many things in there that are just like so weird and wrong, but like the base fundamental one to me is just like this inhuman reading of why women don't want to be sexually assaulted is because it means they can't choose the dad of their baby or the dad might be less likely to invest in the baby. It's nothing to do with like the horror of like having your consent violated, nothing to do with like the horror of like something incredibly intimate happening to you that you don't want to happen. Just like these basic, like human empathetic, obvious understandings for why this would be horrible. It's like, no, no, no. Women just evolved to not like it because it reduces their fitness, but like increases men's fitness. There's also this weird like men versus women's fitness thing that's really present throughout this where he's talking about it as a strategy that men use, but that it's like antagonistic to women. It's not that we're all co-evolving together. And a lot of the times Evo Psych is presented as like, all these things are like men and women finding ways to work together. This is like a very like brute, like, no, this is, decreases women's fitness but increases men's fitness and, and somehow it's like this evolutionary th it's like a very like strange theory to like ultimately at the end there what he says is that women have evolved to these mechanisms to defend themselves against rape or they've evolved with rape and like the rape is an important part of our evolutionary his he says all these things that are serving to like naturalize rape as this thing that's unavoidable, essential to who we are biologically, essential to who men are specifically biologically. Yeah, well, there's really a pathological thing in Evo Psych theory. There's, you know, there's diversity on these questions, and you know, this all these guys wouldn't necessarily co-sign each other's statements, but there's these. Yeah, Thornhill in particular got a lot of pushback on his rape book, I'll say, even among people who are except other Evo psych stuff that we don't agree with. But he's still like wildly, widely like, except he has other theories that people like better. He's on Peterson's podcast as well. I'll have a clip of them on there. But it really is. There, there's a there's this the pop Evo psych pathology. It removes everyone's agency in this really weird way where it like in the context of a system where men dominate women and exploit women and exclude women from the richness of life and the pursuit of their own potential and so on to say that like we're all lifeless evolutionary automatons and men don't have any agency they have a tendency to be monsters for an evolutionary reason women also don't have any, any agency they have a tendency to not like the situation but it's all evolutionary it's all biological so it's uh yeah it's obviously what's natural isn't what's good unless you're talking to jordan peterson and the vibes are getting <laughs> out of control and you guys are really really picking up on what the other guy's putting down then uh <laughs> in that context sometimes is is a little odd if you know what i'm saying yeah uh, and, and... i'm a scientist but i gotta admit is can be a little odd mr jordan peterson let's go there's a weird thing with this too because it's framed as like it's a way for men to get around female choosiness to like prevent them from doing that one thing that like evo psych people say they can do which is like be the great selector who sort men into yes and no you can reproduce rape is a strategy for getting around that Again, leaving aside the fact that like a lot of rape, even in his own data in Randy Thornhill's book, uh, is shown to be like, couldn't possibly be reproductive. And that our evolutionary history of our ability to have aggression, I think a lot of people understand, psychologically speaking, a big reason why people commit sexual assault isn't like a primarily sexual drive it has to do with aggression and anger and displays of dominance and other things like that, which better fits the data of it, like often not being a reproductive act in any way. 
leaving that aside, there's like this element of it that gets back to like the female made choice thing. And like in the same interview, they move on to talking about that. And like the interviewer frames it like there's like this feminists who say that you're blaming women for men being rapists because they do mostly do the selecting, which it seems in weirdly in contradiction with the rape being a way to get around selection thing. But anyway, I'm going to play that clip. His message to feminists. I would also like to ask you, uh, how would you reply to people, in this case particularly perhaps third wave feminists, uh, who, when people say that they should use this knowledge to give advice to particularly young women about, about how to avoid situations and behaviors that would put them more at risk uh, of being vi victims of rape, and then they say that doing this is victim blaming and is a sexist attitude. What, what would you reply to that? Um. My reply is that scientific analysis of a problem is interested in understanding causation. That's what science is for, understanding the causes of things. But science, scientific analysis and blame are different. There's no blame in stated, no blame implied uh, in anything I'm saying. So, uh, I mean, to say that, you know, you would not have any rape in humans if there were not female adaptation for mate choice. That's just a statement of fact. And there's no, that doesn't blame females. It's just a, it's just reality. So we've often emphasized just, you know, you just need to get real. You sometimes get that, oh, you guys are saying, you know, females are to blame, that kind of thing. And uh, there's just no blame in scientific analysis at all. It's different. It's trying to understand causes, not blaming anybody. He called you out, Aaron. You said victim blaming earlier. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> it's just like, we're not, I'm not victim blaming. It's just the fact that if women didn't make these choices or evolve this like sort of made choice thing, men wouldn't try to get around it and they wouldn't re like, it just, it just, it's not their fault. It's just the fact that their things caused the men to do their things. Sir, that, that's a fascinating hypothesis. How did you come to that conclusion? How many layers of evidence have you, <laughs> for that complex like evolutionary theory, how many different studies of different things, how many different reference points can you use to build a comprehensive picture? And, oh, no, no. We just found that like most rape it actually doesn't contribute to furthering genes in any way. But we sort of read that data to say that that's what rape is mostly about. So that's the... Uh, oh. like, <laughs> so you did a little bit of weird... Yeah, that's the other thing. He's just talking about they got to get real. They got to listen to the facts. But then, like, again, the facts don't... Even in his own book, there's so many good analysis you can find of Randy Thornhill's. But we could do a whole episode on Randy Thornhill's book about rape. The facts don't back him up. Even people in his field don't think the facts back him up. But he's on podcast 20 years later, still saying that everyone else just needs to get real, which I guess is like what researchers tend to do. They just believe their own thing no matter what. And it's dependent on other researchers to prove them wrong. But like that arrogance of like feminist, just, oh, they just need to get real and listen to the facts. It's like, it's so grating in this context of like an being a creepy rape guy <laughs> it's an evolutionary adaptation amongst evolutionary psychologists is to posture about the objectivity of your positions a lot in public and on podcasts as a way of furthering your genetic information i have one other randy thornhill clip it's less horrifying it's with jordan peterson rather than this guy and just the jordan has a question a burning question he's been asking he's waiting to ask someone of thornhill's expertise more symmetric men were firing more copulatory orgasms, too. That was a very classic study in human So sexual. I have a specific question about that. Yeah. I've always wanted to ask a biologist interested in sexual behavior, but I know that there's been a lot of discussion about the hypothetical evolutionary purpose of female orgasm. And I was wondering if female orgasm is disproportionately likely to trigger male orgasm. I, because it could be, it could be an yeah. adaptation that's used to elicit Pregnancy, essentially. Yeah, I don't think it is. It's there's no there's there's no evidence that females that orgasm very infrequently have fewer babies, and actually, women who don't ever orgasm can be quite fertile. So I don't think it's fundamentally that. I think what it is 
is it's part of female mate choice and more and more basically sire choice of the female. Let me explain. So when a female uh, has an orgasm, she has uterine contraction, of course, and that pull, it works like a suction. It pulls the uh, content of the vagina up to the cervix. So it puts the puts the content of the vagina in a good place. And if that content includes the male's ejaculate, then she's pulling the male's ejaculate up to the cervix where it's easier for him to get, you know, easier for the ejaculate to get into the right place to conceive. So if she, imagine a female who has two mating partners. She orgasms with one, pulling his ejaculate up to the cervix, and she skips orgasm with the other partner. So she, in effect, is mated with both men. So that is, you know, same mating success of the two men, if you just look at mating success. But she's doing something more subtle that is differentially affecting the fertilizing capacity of the ejaculate of the two men. The, man, the ejaculate she pulls up has more potential for fertilization. And that's a component of cryptic female choice. So uh, in the 80s, I discovered uh, what I labeled as cryptic female choice, first in insects, and then uh, it, it applied to f uh, female uh, orgasm uh, too in, in, uh, in humans. The clip is so funny to me because Jordan Peterson, the, what is the, what, what the, what the female orgasm? Why? Why would it be there? Why? And then the other one's like, okay, imagine a situation where you just fuck two dudes, uh, but you only orgasmed with one of them. Your, your cervix is going to suck up the cum from the <laughs> orgasmed one better. I don't know the idea that like it's about sire choice and not like wouldn't that if if it had to do with like sucking up the cum <laughs> to the cervix wouldn't that just like make you more likely to get pregnant any like why does it have to be this situation where there's two guys and it's choosing between the two sperm he doesn't right, explain no. why there's a real cuckold fantasy there that <laughs> like, well, let, let me explain this in terms of a little cuckold fantasy. Imagine <laughs> a woman who just had sex with two men. <laughs> One of them is so good, so just totally <laughs> giving it to her. <laughs> And the other one just watching. You can't even do anything about it. <laughs> I imagine this all the time, scientifically. But it's it's because evolution, the evolutionary realism, um, social hierarchy, justifying class of evolutionism. It's all about like competition and the idea of like you know like you could interpret maybe competition as like a metaphor, something that shows up in different places in in history at different times, or as like a metaphor for the overall process of the sanding of the stones of the genetics across time but like it's only in certain certain contexts where you'll have like a direct head-to-head -head competition for a specific thing like there's no the the idea of the entirety of nature is this like enormous competition is like we should be clear is like a metaphor it's like we're, we're taking our cognitive imaginary view of like olympic sporting games and stuff and then we're applying that to nature as a metaphor that's why he creates the cuckold fantasy <laughs> The detail on that was really, he has a passion <laughs> for that story. He does. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's funny, too, because the whole thing launches from this idea that we need a special explanation for the female orgasm compared to the male orgasm. Rather than just being like, humans develop like genital tissues it feels good when you stimulate it because it makes sex feel good and makes people more likely to want to have sex just like the most basic evolutionary explanation in the universe suffices to explain both male and female orgasms extremely easily and also we're like more similar than we are different biologically so you would actually need a special explanation why females don't orgasm yeah like what would make it impossible yeah like what would get in the way of it like the same sort of like machinery that's a bit more of an innie than an Audi. why wouldn't you be able to crescendo that pleasure in such a way like wh why would it what would block it in women but yeah in this actually it's a good point to make about dimorphic sex characteristics in relation to the human body it's like even with a very generous account of sort of like the biological differences between the sexes how that's actually deployed and changes across the body is a relatively minor proportion of the overall systems. Like none of the systems that make the 
body work at a fundamental level are affected by it. You know, we have the same brain, same lung, same skin, etc. Right. Although there's different modifiers for uh, at least some of these things. Estrogen causes softer skin. Right. But like, yeah, the same tissue that forms the penis in a male typical development forms the clitoris in a female typical development. So like, because you could be like, oh, well, the places where it is different is like the genitals. Most of all, it's one of the most different things between the two general sex developmental trajectories humans can go down. But like even in that case, it's like you're working with some of the same basic fundamental building blocks that just kind of like develop differently depending on how your hormones wash out during the womb and further development later. So yeah, like in, in order for like a sex difference to evolve, I mean, I think a lot of that is is really, you're, we're probably dealing with stuff from a really long time ago. Yeah. Oh, That's yeah, like yeah, old, yeah. old shit. That's like yeah. deep, deep. That's like, I mean, even further than this, but like all mammals kind of share similar dimorphisms there around like other animals too but like yeah and our our sex differences in humans are smaller than in contemporaries in the family tree great apes right we are more androgynous than other great apes right so that would suggest that the thing that makes us different from them is at least in part a move towards more androgyny Right. Uh, which is also reinforced by the Menken lactate factoid. Yeah, something you never hear those Evo psych people talk about for some reason. The Menken lactate factoid. We now go to Frontiers of Evolutionary Psychology! All right. So, sperm wars. Right. The things Jordan Peterson and Randy Thornhill here were talking about reminded me of Sperm Wars, which is a 1996 book by Robin Baker that lays out a variety of different theories relating to both evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology predicated around male competition for women, basically, but also getting down to like a more biological level. He proposes that even men's sperm compete with one another if you again imagine a scenario where a woman has sex with one man and then has sex with another man very quickly after so there's like sperm mixture sperm, happening yeah in the in the the fallopian tubes and whatnot yeah and he proposes that there's actually three different types of sperm uh the egg getters which is uh, apparently the most rare type of sperm these are the like the, the seeker in quidditch yeah yeah exactly the <laughs> <laughs> the one who's just like rushing straight for that egg trying to, they're like out in front of all the other ones maybe the fastest runners or swimmers i guess sorry it'd be crazy if they had little legs sperm had little legs and like yeah, crawl run, run around the, oh, on the sides of the, the That's horrible. I don't want to vaginal wall climbing through the cervix like with little, their little arms yeah <laughs> like little monkeys uh <laughs> little homunculi there's the killer sperm which is like kind of part of the army they go and attack the other sperm uh, Quidditch terms, those are called beaters, if I remember correctly. Yes, uh, similar. And then there's the blockers, which are uh, sperm that I guess they're not trying to kill the other sperm so much. They're just like, you know, in like a basketball game, you stand up in front of them with your arms up <laughs> trying to prevent them from that's making so a goal. That's cute to imagine sperm doing that, being like <laughs> <laughs> two sets of sperm heading towards the same egg. And then some of the sperms are like, uh, uh, uh. Like yeah, like getting... the egg getters are trying to swim past, but the blockers are like, no, no, no they're like getting in the way trying to this sounds like a pretty them. scientific theory is it true and backed by evidence <laughs> no it's not true it was based on from what i can tell like if you look at sperm under a microscope you'll you will see differences some of them swim faster some of them are bigger some of them are smaller they, they don't all look exactly the same so when you combine that with the fact that uh, sperm they can release chemicals that will hurt other sperm and they can um, I don't know how to pronounce this word. It's like ag agglutination or something where they like basically run into another sperm and then they both like get glued to each other and fall down. That's my mental image of it. If any biologists are listening and I didn't describe that well, I'm so sorry. But so these are things that happen in sperm. And just basically from that, he was like, oh, this is why that's happening. There's this sperm war going on. Yeah, coming from this idea of like competitive naturalism, 
Yeah, men compete for women in the physical world. They're like beating each other up to see but when it who gets, gets close. Sex. When it's when it's <laughs> tight and it's not clear who is going to get the sperm and the egg, then the sperm go into action and have their own little competition, a microcosm of it. Right, exactly. For when the outside mano a mano competition gets too close and they're both they're both <laughs> they're both completing sex within a narrow window of each other. So there's been a couple studies looking at this since that have uh, failed to confirm this, to put it as nicely as possible. I don't think it's been like fully disproven. I think it's kind of hard to fully disprove. But uh, one 1999 study, basically they took a bunch of different sperm from different guys. I call that Saturday night. <laughs> and they dyed it different colors. You can actually dye the sperm different colors so that when you look under a microscope, when you mix it together, obviously you're going to mix the sperms together to see if they fight. You can kind of better see what's happening. So they did this, they look under the microscope and to read from their results, we observed very few significant changes in sperm aggregation or performance in mixtures of sperm from different males compared with mixtures from the same male and none that were consistent with previously reported findings. Those being the idea of sperm or so basically what they're saying is we didn't notice sperm killing each other or running into each other and, and falling down at a higher rate when there was sperm from two different men in the same petri dish versus sperm just from one man in the same petri dish so the theory that sperm are literally going to war to protect their own egg getters at the expense of the others they're, they're like attacking the other sperm there has to be some sort of awareness and selectivity in the sperm only doing these things to sperm of other males because if right. they're doing the same thing to sperm whether it's if the two different other, dyes if the two different dyed sperm were fighting with each other more it'd be proof of the sperm wars hypothesis but right. since they're just randomly smashing into each other just the same yeah then it's proof of sort of the mindless sperm buzzing out to death in exactly, many yeah. circumstances hypothesis yeah so yeah that's that's the basic rundown of what i got of where the evidence is currently at this is not a it makes me think respected you know, you know in star wars episode one and during the pod race when one of them loses one of its engines and it starts like spiraling out and it's like ah Right. That's what I imagine <laughs> some of these sperms are like, is like they come out and they're like, they're like mindless little like genetic automatons. And then some of them are lucky enough that in the randomness of the productive capacity of the testes, that they're really fast and just, and one of them makes it. And then some of the other ones just kind of like wiggle around in corners and stuff. <laughs> and then some of them think that they're going, and they're like, yeah, I'm doing it. And then they're like, ah, it's like one of my engines is going, ah, and it like goes the wrong way and spins <laughs> out. And, out and <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I feel like my theory of mind on sperm uh, was more accurate than the sperm wars book based on this. Like my theory of mind in the sperm, I feel like I know what it's like to be a sperm. Maybe I remember. Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, and trust me, it's not a war at all. It's like you're really fast. You're like the seeker. You're like... It's like when the, fa uh, the, you're not, you're not the even flash is running. You're not attention to whether the sperm around you is from the same man or another man. You don't even right, care because no, you just want to get to the egg. Exactly. And any, any distraction from getting to that egg is going to mean a big L. you got to be dedicated. <laughs> Uh, I, I wanted to pull something out of this book that was a bit more psychological. Uh, so looking at it, there there was some classic Evo Psych research here related to uh, the plunger dick hypothesis, which also, again, has to do with two men ejaculating into a woman within quick succession of each other. There's a proposed theory about the morphology of the human penis that the bell end shape of the penis head uh, exists because it uh, will pull s the semen of other men out of the vagina and replace it with your own. Like it's a, yeah. it's a sort of plunger pulling it back and out. Um, that seems to be a theory that is like, I, I don't think it's like fully confirmed. It seems like ver fairly accepted that that's the reason it's shaped like that. Probably just because we have no other better explanation. But may maybe it's true. Maybe there was enough times that happened in history that it shaped the penis that way. I don't know. I, I, 
who's to say? But the psychological aspect of this was that they did uh, some studies using uh, various shaped dildos with bigger and smaller heads and various shaped fake vaginas uh, that they noticed that when you thrust deeper and harder, or sorry, deeper and faster, not harder, you pull more sperm out. And then they pulled some college students and they asked them, have you ever been in a relationship where there was suspected female infidelity? They asked both men and women this. And then they asked them, did you have sex right after that, after the suspected female infidelity? And if you did have sex right after that, did you notice a difference in the thrusting or depth of the sex? Was there, was there a faster thrust or a deeper thrust? And what they found was about half, a little over half of men and women said they did notice a difference. And of the ones that said they did notice a difference, uh, the majority, depending on whether you're talking about depth or speed or men or women, there's some variation, but about 60 to 80% said things like faster, deeper versus smaller percentages saying, oh no, it was actually slower or less deep. There was a few who said that it was pretty low, like 10 to 5. Evolutionarily maladaptive people. <laughs> who are just like, oh, I suspect you of infidelity. Here's some shorter thrusts. It's, I don't know. <laughs> this, I don't know. This is kind of goofy. I don't really care about this. It f makes sense to me in a way where like, oh, you just, you suspected someone of an infidelity. You're going to like fuck them harder or really good to like, I don't know, like prove you're good at it or something. I don't think I would have thought about plunging other sperm out, but maybe that's the secret evolutionary psychology thing underneath. I don't know. The evidence for this seems about as good as a lot of this other Evo psych stuff. I didn't find any counter research where people were like, no, more people said slower, but it was only barely more than half who said they noticed a difference at all. Slightly less than half said that, yes, they'd had female infidelity worries or uh, accusations, but the sex was just like the same after. So it wasn't like a big effect. If it's there, it's a pretty small effect. But, you know. It's like a malformed question. It's like if you found evidence that people fucked slower, like what would that even mean? Like, oh, after infidelity, they fuck slower. It's because at some point in history, there was like an evolutionary pressure to fuck slower <laughs> after infidelity. Like right. it doesn't, it's, yeah, it's like weirdly geneticized. Like, I don't know this. I wonder if the, these, this, whoever came up with this would have come up with this theory if they didn't watch so much porno. Like there's some, <laughs> yeah, this whole book is like, yeah, the book written on the theory of like, fear of being cucked but like also kind of like it seems erotic like to like be thinking about this even when randy thornhill and jordan peterson are talking about it, it's like there's kind of like a a fear horniness <laughs> axis here going on i don't know i, yeah, I don't want to psychologically this, analyze them necessarily it's, it's, but it's like uh it's, it's like the pseudoscientific erotica yeah to, to exactly like, for all these like these insecure scientists to like read and titillate themselves yeah, I can think of a few issues uh, with this theory, and, and the main one—the main one is just the main one that it always is, which is like there are cultural explanations. With even if this was like an absolute, a hundred percent of people were like, "Yeah, we had crazy sex right after th that one of us cheated on the other, or whatever." Like that wouldn't even mean that there's an evolutionary, genetic basis in our brain that in situations of female infidelity people like thrust deeper yeah people thrust faster because they're genetically programmed to pull out that sperm let's like i don't even know how you would how you would i'm trying to think of like how you even would prove that but like it's not worth proving in the first place but i also think it's just not real so 50 percent say that there's a difference let's say like a difference that's broadly in line with this hypothesis and then some percentage of those people are having sex more furiously because they're trying to do something else like some percentage of that 50 percent is probably like displaced aggression like right. a, sort of like a mis misogynist like angry fucking or something like that and then part of that is probably like trying to like fuck extra good to like 
pull them back towards you. The variety of choices in life that lead to reproducing or not. This is such a minor scenario that it's the idea that it would be genetically selected for across the entire human population seems unlikely to me. And yeah, this is, I find this, this, I find this concept very, very porno-y. Like I'm reading someone's diary or something like it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like a real theory that way. And it was the same one that Thornhill was talking about it. I was like, you horny guy, just like <laughs> fucking get out of here. Stop, you fucking crusty old man just getting horned up about this stuff in public, acting like he's talking about how women's minds work. Right, it's yeah. Like, oh my God, dude. Just get a live journal or something or just like <laughs> get, a fan, get a fan fiction account and just... All right, so that's uh, that's a kind of little smorgasbord of sperm wars uh, theories and things. I just thought it was really funny. I thought this clip of them was funny, and I thought the idea of sperm wars in general is funny. It's not a super well-regarded book in the evolutionary biology or psychology field, but it definitely continues to have its defenders. And that was Frontiers of Evolutionary Psychology! Today's episode of Seriously Wrong is brought to you by... Sperm Wars Episode 4, A New Rope. It is a time of great unrest in the vaginal canal. Imperial sperm have had their attempts at impregnation foiled by a band of revel sperm implanted by a rival lover. From the creators of Sperm Park and it's a sperm, 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 sperm world comes a new generation. Darth Sperm, you can't get away with this. I am going to the egg. Featuring lovable characters like Luke Spermwalker, Spermbacca, and R2 Sperm2. He told me enough. He told me you killed my father's sperm. No, I am your father's sperm. No! Wow, that looks exciting. We are back here at Film Corner. I've got sitting across from me, George Lucas. Mm. I've been a huge fan for a long time. Thank you. Uh, What inspired you to go and remake Star Wars now with an entirely sperm cast? Well, thank you so much for asking that. And thank you so much for having me here. And, you know, I've always been a big believer in the power of myth and telling and retelling uh, really these deep, true stories about the world. And sperm just seemed like the natural medium to move filmmaking into in this new age. Uh, You know, I've always been an innovator in film and realizing that we could cast all sperm, that we could shoot in a Petri dish with microscopes and really bring something special to the screen. It just invigorated me. Well, it seems to have invigorated audiences. This is is, is uh, the top film of all time at this point, Sperm Wars Episode 4, A New Rope. It's displaced Avatar, it's displaced Titanic, it's displaced the Avengers movies. Yeah, I hear that some other filmmakers are now dabbling in sperm as well. It might be starting a new trend. Absolutely, yeah. Avatars 4 and 5 are shooting right now. James Cameron is doing them with sperm. So and this is real sperm being shot through a, a microscope like absolutely. your film. Absolutely, yeah. Real sperm. I hear he's even pioneering some new filming techniques uh, for how to film those sperm. That's so Jim. He's always on the cutting edge. Absolutely. So when you were filming this, did you ever accidentally get a little bit of sperm on your hand or on your shirt or something like that? Oh, sure. Yeah. You know, I tell my wife, if I'm coming home covered in sperm, that's how you know it was a good day at the shoot. And I understand you did this shoot in one big burst at first and then smaller dwindling bursts after that ever smaller until eventually the shoot was finished. Is that right? Yeah, I would say there was a few big volleys at the beginning, uh, big burst, big burst, big, bur- and then smaller burst, smaller, kind of like more of a drizzle. There must have the, the the volumes of film that you had must have mm-hmm. been quite a bit on your hands. Look, it was a big load of film. I'm not going to say that it wasn't a big load of film. It was. And did you put the cream of the crop in the movie or... How did you filter oh, it? Yeah, a lot of people ask that. They ask how you choose between. And really, there's there's only one answer in this and in all types of art, really, which is you choose by taste. Well, thank you so much. That is a climactic end to thank a you. very yeah. passionate but short-lived interview. 
It was only a few minutes, I guess. Thank you. Well, it's been a real treat for me being here as well. But yeah, I'm heading back home. I'm currently writing The Sperm Strikes Back and The Return of the Sperm. Uh, and then right after that, moving into, you know, The Phantom Sperm, Attack of the Sperm. Right, of and, course. Uh, Revenge of the Sperm. Well, I think I speak for everyone to say that I am going to be there with my 3D glasses on, on day one. It's There's nothing like, if you haven't seen it, folks, you got to go see Oh, it's made for the big screen. Sperm it's Wars for a new rope. Shot uh, under a microscope, but made to be seen on the big screen. It's like you're really there in the semen with the sperm. So we are getting to the end of the episode here now, but we do have one last clip, which is bringing it back to Huberman and David Buss. Uh, take it away, gentlemen. In evolutionary psychology context, what is jealousy? Does it relate to paternity issues only? When I first started studying jealousy, jealousy was regarded as a sign of immaturity, insecurity, a neurosis or pathology, or in some cases, delusion. And what I argued is that jealousy is an evolved emotion that serves several adaptive functions. Once you have long-term mating, you need a defense to prevent or preserve the investment that you've made and are making in long-term mateship. And so jealousy motivates people to be attentive to potential mate poachers in their environment. But even more subtle things like mate value discrepancies can trigger jealousy. So even if there are no mate poachers and no cues to infidelity, if in the American system, like you're a six or an eight or a 10, and people generally pair off based on similarity and mate value. So that tends to happen. Tends sixes end up with sixes, sevens yeah. end up with sixes, yeah. plus or minus one. Yeah, yeah. Right. He's not good enough for you. Okay, but discrepancies can open up where none previously existed. You get fired from a job or someone's career takes off. Let's say a woman becomes a, a famous singer or actress or, or, or a man does. All of a sudden there's a mate value discrepancy where you have access to a larger pool of potential mates and higher mate value potential mates. Jealousy is an emotion that gets activated by these circumstances. And then what people do about it depends on what their options are. And people do things that in my published scientific work, I say range from vigilance to violence. And so in my new book, uh, When Men Behave Badly, I have a whole chapter on intimate partner violence uh, what I argue, and this is really unfortunate, and I, I'm not endorsing, I think I'm, it's illegal, it's bad, don't do it. But in America, something like 28 to 30 percent of all people who are married will experience intimate partner violence in their relationships. So it's not a trivial percentage. But one of the things that is functional about the violence is that it tends to reduce perceived mate value discrepancies. And guys tend to engage in the violence more than women do, although some argue that there's more equality in the violence. Uh, but uh, at a minimum, men tend to do more damage when they do the violence. And when you're talking about violence, is this ever emotional violence? Yeah, uh, there, there's that as well. And in fact, the two tend to be correlated. So in my studies of married couples, verbal violence is a good predictor of physical violence happening as well. So one thing that will happen just to give a concrete example, guys will start insulting their partner's appearance. Hey, you're, you're really looking ugly today. Your, your thighs are heavy. You're uh, not looking very good. So they try to denigrate the woman's appearance, which is a key component of woman's mate value. So they're trying to adjust more closely the mate value discrepancy. Yeah, they're trying to reduce her self-perceived mate value. So if, if let's say he's a six, she's an eight, and he can convince her that she's actually only a six, then she's going to be more likely to stay with him. Very diabolical. It's terribly diabolical. But the fact is women don't feel good about themselves mm -hmm. um, when they get uh, beaten up uh, by their partner. In fact, in the cases where it leaves physical evidence, you know, the, the bruises, it literally does lower the mate value of the woman by uh, injuring her physical appearance. And getting her to conceal herself, stay home. Yeah, exactly. Et yeah, she's taking her out of the, the literally reducing her visibility. I don't think that was intended to be a tool to help me in my everyday life and my dating. And I believe them when they say, yeah, don't do this. Yeah, specifically said, don't do this. Yeah. But 
it is presented alongside all the other tools that are like, oh, here's how evolutionary psychology works. And these are things that can help you find a mate this and keep out, a mate. And- so it's the context. Yeah, here's tools for helping you find and keep a mate. And Huberman says, what's the deal with jealousy? And he responds, well, you see, people have sort of a sexual market value, a number between zero and 10 that represents how valuable they are. Which also like citation needed on the whole there's a number out of 10 that everybody has and like (laughs) people can't even agree that IQ is a reliable indicator of a single like intelligence number but somehow everybody has like this Howard Stern-esque like rating of everybody on a thing it's like if you're going to use that in your scientific presentations of facts like you need to like validate that that number exists that we can like determine it and that it's real. So, yeah, and he's saying that this is undesirable and negative, well, thank God, but also that it's an evolved trait, that it's part of the evolution. He's like, in the context of evolutionary psychology, what is jealousy? Blah, blah, blah. We get to this. He's he's talking about the function of domestic violence. He's talking about domestic violence as having a function. In sexual selection. And evolution. Yeah. And like, it's like saying, here's a dark tool. Don't use this tool, but here's a, like, you know, here's a tool. It's a good tool. It's a good tool. And then, you know, like, welcome back to the Huberman podcast. Today, we're talking about tools that can help you in life and relationships. And one particular tool, which works and has a function, but we must never use because it's illegal. It's wrong. Don't do it. (laughs) Uh, But also like, it doesn't work. Like, I mean, kind of works. And that people have difficulty leaving abusive spouses, but also part of patriarchy had to be that we made it illegal for people to get divorced, like just on the life advice scale. Like this is not, it's not just that it's wrong. It's that it's not a good strategy for building a long-term relationship. If that's what you want, it will genuinely deprive both people in the arrangement from getting that like human connection that they want. And we've trained people on this voice, like Huberman's voice of expertise across the whole episode, talking about this science about where people came from and what made us what we are. And people are trained to think the number is real. And he's saying the number is real and it can be changed, but it shouldn't be changed. And that jealousy serves a function against mate poachers, but also serves a function in closing the gap between differences. Like there's something... I think that they, I do think that they mean well. I don't think that they're saying, having this conversation because they're actively like trying to enable people to be violent to their partners or something. But the overall context and the logic that leads up to it and the conversation that it comes out of, there's something really sick about this. Yeah. I mean, it's the same thing that Thornhill is doing for rape, which is offering a justification for it while saying that oh, this isn't like a interpersonal justification. It's more of like an, a deeper evolutionary justification that also serves to naturalize it. And like, you know, I could excuse anybody listening to this coming away from it uh, if they take what they're saying seriously, thinking that domestic violence is a natural, innate, unchangeable fact of human relations because if there's a way to reduce the number, some people, even if it's immoral, are going to do it. And like just their whole framework of like having to assume that every behavior has this evolutionary reason for it. When you get to these really horrifying behaviors like sexual assault, like domestic violence, the reasons become justifications. And like they'll try to say that they're not, but there's, it's really hard to read it any other way other than a justification. And this relates to the attitudes about patriarchy that he shared on the Peterson podcast, that patriarchy isn't real, but everything that patriarchy theorists say are happening is happening. It's just natural. So I'm simultaneously in the position of defending actually existing patriarchy while claiming that the entire logic of it, the accusation is incoherent and So Buss is out of sort of a sincere, uh, maybe partially naive attempt at neutrality, sharing a kind of guidebook for patriarchal violence on the premises of saying that it's an unfortunate evolved trait. And then he's broadcasting that to a very large audience of people who come to that podcast in particular for scientific advice on how to live their life. And it can't help but feel he wouldn't do that if he actually understood what patriarchy theorists were saying. 
Yeah. I mean, it like seems obviously irresponsible just as like a scientist who's a public speaker, uh, like going out and making this claim is like irresponsible academically. But then, yeah, if you think about any of the implications of what people hearing this claim might like take away from it, it's like way even worse than just the like sort of factual thing. But like the factual thing does bug me because again, these numbers, like what? You're a scientist. Like, where are you getting this number from? If you're a scientist and you're making a claim that numbers exist and can be assigned to people, like, you need a process for doing that. You need a. It feels like a goofy thing usually when they're doing it, but when it is drawn into this context of domestic violence, it's like really like horrifying. This like assigning and ranking of people. We said earlier that evolutionary psychology is not just an impartial science, it's a political movement, but it's also connected to a culture, a a political culture and common sense of misogyny in our society. And I know for a fact that people are influenced by this kind of thing because I've spoken to them. I've heard people say very misogynistic things using the same kind of language, the same kind of defenses of David Buss and Huberman in this clip or Thornhill in his clips, his weird clips. What happens is there's kind of a a degradation of through these like echoes into culture and society, the ideas are degraded into a sort of a parody of themselves. And we're uh, we're out of time this episode, but I think that's what we're going to be talking about when we return to the subject where evolutionary psychology completely departs with science. Yeah, it's one thing when you listen to these like actual academics talking about these ideas, they have to like at least somewhat tie it to some research or things that they, uh, you know, they're at least somewhat careful about it. But once you move out of this into the realm of just pure influencers uh, who speak to big audiences, spreading ideas, like it gets like a lot worse. In other news, the sex rate has dropped to 0% as commercially available cloning has become available to consumers who desire to protect their genes, and only their genes, for as long as possible. Now, I thought I enjoyed sex, but under the surface, it was always about reproducing my personal genes as much as possible. When Clone Corp made cloning available for all of us, I got so horny for cloning that I didn't need sex anymore. I'm not going to dilute my precious genes with those of some fertile mate. You know, maybe their genes will overpower mine. We are in competition, after all. In other news, Howard Stern has started a partnership with David Buss at the Institute of Evolutionary Psychology to do a study to understand why tens evolved to be so crazy. At press time, Howard said that next up on the docket to be studied was, quote, fat chicks. And in other news, cancel culture gone sexual? Podcaster and evolutionary psychologist Young Smooth has been removed from his post at the Science of Women podcast following a scandal when it was revealed that he wasn't taking advantage of younger women. Multiple accusers have not come forward because they do not exist, sending his fans into a harassing rage. His former co-host, Player X, told reporters, This is unacceptable. We have zero tolerance at the Science of Women podcast for this kind of behavior. In other news, the evolutionary riddle of the existence of gay people has been solved at last. A new study has proven definitively that parades every year increase the morale of the straight population, increasing net fertility by as much as 4%. In other news, all of the evolutionary psychologists who, quote, were going to get in trouble for saying this, end quote, have finally been brought to justice by a people's tribunal. They are now in trouble after formerly being in the position of going to get in trouble. Their statements that they were, quote, going to get in trouble are being used as evidence by the judge to indicate knowing intent. All right. And well, I think that is all the time we have to listen to these clips of this bullshit uh, for today. That's about about it. Um, Yeah, that was a learning journey. Yeah. Journey learning. 
we'll be back again with, we're going to do a third one in a little while. So feel free to, we've had people send in more information to us. The women's shopping study was sent to us by a listener. Shout out to Benjamin. Great find. And also, actually, a lot of people have sent us information on Twitter over time. In particular, Arnold Schroeder of the Fight Like an Animal podcast has sent a lot of information our way related to evolutionary psychology. For example, the Mothers and Others book I talked about last episode, which is, I think, the best quote-unquote evolutionary psychology I've read. And also, What is Politics? Uh, As a YouTuber, he sent us some great links, some books uh, to check out on Twitter as well. Uh, But that's that's not everyone. A lot of people sent in stuff. Uh, Those are just people. I remember off the top of my head. So uh, thanks everyone for doing that. Feel free to do that again because it's going to be a little while before we do this third part as we uh, tackle a few other topics and we'll return. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, If you enjoy what we do and you want to support what we do, head on over to our Patreon. Uh, Our Patreon is our listener supporting community that helps us through monthly donations, six bucks a month keep the show going, keep the show uh, functioning under capitalism, keeps our our rent paid and our bean cans full. We couldn't do it without you, our donor community on Patreon. And hey, if you sign up for six bucks a month, you will get access to our full archive, all the episodes stretching all the way back, almost 10 years of podcast episodes now. And uh, you'll get access to bonus episodes. We've done a lot of bonus episodes recently. We have a whole series on Jordan Peterson's 10 Rules for Life. We have a series on the Atlas Shrugged film trilogy adaptations. And just there's a whole bunch of great stuff there behind the paywall. So, uh, yeah, if you like what we do, for six quick bucks a month, you can support us and get access to all those great, great little goodies. Everyone else is doing it. Don't want to be left out. So, yeah, thanks for listening, and we'll see you again soon. And lots of confident people are competent, but some confident people aren't competent, but they can (laughs) fool you.